Subcommittee on Government Operations will come to order, and without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Uh, the Chair uh, notices the President of our colleague, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gozar. I ask unanimous consent if uh, Mr. Gozar would be allowed to fully participate in this hearing. Without objection, oh, right. I guess he's on the way, huh? Okay, all right. He was just here. I, he's like a ghost of Christmas past. Uh, so um, uh, I want to thank both of the witnesses for being here. Uh, nonprofit organizations that qualify for tax exempt status under Section 501c3 must be organized and operate exclusively for religious, charitable, scientific, or other similar purposes. Clinton Foundation is registered as a 501c3 but continues to come under scrutiny for allegations of pay-to-play transactions and fa failure to meet requirements to retain the tax-exempt status. Today's subcommittee will examine the reports and allegations against the Clinton Foundation in related, uh, in, uh, in related to allegations of pay-to-play activities. This subcommittee will also hear testimony from whistleblowers alleging the abuse of the charitable organization's status uh, by the Clinton Foundation. And just recently, the Clinton Foundation was back in the news due to a sharp decrease in donations from fiscal year 2016 to fiscal year 2017. The donations for, uh, to the foundation were $63 million in 2016 and only $26.6 million in 2017. Now, this represents a 58 percent decrease in the span of one fiscal year and corresponds with, obviously, Secretary Clinton's loss in the 2000 presidential election. Now, several reports suggest that the decrease in donations could reflect a pay-to-play activity in the years prior to the, the, the decline in donations. Uh, the numerous uh, pay-to-play reports and allegations has led Congress to call for a special prosecutor to investigate the Clinton Foundation. In response, uh, former Attorney General Sessions appointed U.S. Attorney John Huber to, uh, to investigate the alleged wrongdoings by the Clinton Foundation. Uh, Mr. Huber was, joined, uh, was asked to join us this afternoon and update the committee on the operations and progress of his investigation. And unfortunately, DOJ has been unwilling to make him available. I find this not only frustrating for me, but frustrating for the American people. If indeed a special prosecutor was not appointed, and Mr. Huber was supposed to take that role, then why indeed uh, has, have we not heard from him publicly in almost nine months? And so, sadly, uh, we will look at, at his loss of testimony today as uh, perhaps an indictment on his inability to provide transparent oversight testimony before this committee. Now, the IRS was also scheduled to attend uh, for this 501c3 registration uh, oversight and, and the potential claims uh, of the whistleblowers. And uh, sadly, Mr. Horton was unable to attend due to a death in his family. This is certainly uh, uh, recognized as a legitimate uh, excuse, and my thoughts and prayers go out to him and his family in this tough time. But we do have with us today Tom Fenton, uh, a president of Judicial Watch, who will be testifying here today about the body of work that he is conducting as it relates to the use of Clinton Foundation as a vehicle for pay-to-play uh, transactions. And finally, Mr. Philip Hackney, uh, an associate professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh. He rounds out our first panel and will discuss the allegations against the Trump Foundation that we have uh, as, where there has been the subject of media reports as well. Uh, the committee has also received over 1,300 pages of documents from the whistleblowers' claims that they've submitted to the IRS. These documents are part of a larger 48-page uh, whistleblower claim submission with 95 formal exe uh, exhibits, as much as approximately 6,000 pages of documents, and the claims allege abuse of charitable organization status by the Clinton Foundation. To further discuss their claims, we'll be joined uh, by Mr. Lawrence Doyle and Mr. John Monahan on a separate panel following our current witnesses. I'd like to thank everyone for being here today and look forward uh, to your testimony. I now recognize the ranking member, my good friend, Mr. Conley, for his opening statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and this, I guess, may be your last hearing. 
uh, as chairman of the subcommittee. And I well, I'm glad you added the last part of that. <laughs> uh, and um, I certainly look forward to working with you again in the new Congress. Unfortunately, I don't really look forward to working with you today. Um, you know, here we are a few weeks before Christmas, and the, my Republican friends are re-gifting an old trope that needs desperate reworking. They have found nothing, but that doesn't stop them from trying to do it again. And of course, uh, Mr. Cummings and I have repeatedly requested that we have witnesses from the Trump Foundation and from FACTS, Mr. Whitaker's foundation, uh, before us. If we're going to be looking at nonprofit foundations, let's actually look at some that have outstanding uh, allegations, including a pending criminal investigation against them, unlike the Clinton administration. Um, so let's look at this latest so-called set of allegations with respect to the Clinton Foundation. This uh, next panel uh, has two private individuals, both Republicans, the panel after this, who will explain how they submitted a complaint to the IRS and the FBI against the Clinton Foundation. They have already conceded that they are not whistleblowers. Instead, they are would-be plaintiffs in a lawsuit seeking to make money. That's not a whistleblower. They also admit they have no first-hand knowledge of any wrongdoing. Their first claim is that internal reports issued a decade ago suggest that there were mismanagement challenges at the foundation. These internal reports were already leaked by WikiLeaks long ago. The Clinton Foundation commissioned these reports internally, voluntarily, and then made substantial improvements to address their findings. That's neither a scandal nor new. Next, they claim there was a quid pro quo between the Clinton Foundation and its donors. But that's not what these reports said. They said some employees raised concerns about donors who, quote, may have an expectation of quid pro quo benefit in return for gifts. No evidence exists of any such quid pro quo. But rather, employees who said some donors might have had expectation, even if unfulfilled. Nevertheless, that doesn't stop some from trying to smear, yet again, the Clinton name. Next, they will report on a secret interview they conducted with the chief financial officer of the foundation. Andy Kessel, during a breakfast in 2016. They claim Mr. Kessel made statements criticizing President Bill Clinton and the foundation. They claim that Mr. Kessel stated, and I quote, I know where all the bodies are buried, unquote. My Lord. But Mr. Kessel denies saying this. And all we have to contradict him is a one-page summary submitted as part of the complaint by these Republican litigants in their lawsuit. <coughs> So what did the IRS and FBI do with the complaint? The IRS rejected it. According to the testimony of these two gentlemen, the IRS sent them a denial letter. They said that they have appealed, but they've refused to give us a copy of their original complaint or their appeal. How about the FBI? Well, apparently the FBI interviewed the Clinton Foundation CFO last year, but like the IRS, took no further action that we know of. The chairman invited the Justice Department to be here today. They refused to come. The Trump Justice Department refused to send someone to this hearing. I will agree with the chairman. When a request is made by this committee of the executive branch, it should always be honored unless there are extraordinary circumstances. But I suspect one of the reasons they're not here is because there's no there there. And they don't want to have to testify to that fact, given the pillaring President Trump has engaged in with respect to the Clintons personally. Finally, there's one last delegation, Mr. Chairman. Two days ago, John Solomon wrote an opinion piece in The Hill, a newspaper here in The Hill, claiming that the Clinton Foundation somehow misled the IRS based on state regulatory filing errors. This was reported two years ago. One tax expert, Professor James Fishman, summarized the allegations then as, quote, minor infractions equivalent to reporting someone 
who was issued a traffic ticket for parking 15 inches from the curb instead of the statutory 12. Unfortunately, this is part of a pattern. My friends on the other side of the aisle have been making unsubstantiated claims against the Foundation for years. <coughs> Last year, Republicans in this committee launched a joint investigation with the Intelligence Committee with claims of explosive new evidence from a confidential informant who could demonstrate Secretary Clinton orchestrated a quid pro quo with all nine agencies of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States to approve the Uranium One deal, remember that one, and corruptly direct millions of dollars to the Foundation in return. My friends withheld their secret informant from us for months. But when we finally got the opportunity to interview that informant, his claims fell apart and failed to provide any evidence for the repeated and baseless claims. Before this hearing, I sent a letter to you, Mr. Chairman, asking if you planned on inviting the Clinton Foundation to also invite the Trump Foundation and the foundation operated by Acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker. There have been serious allegations against both, including a judicial ruling saying that uh, and a, a, a case against the Trump Foundation, in fact, can go forward. But unfortunately, uh, those requests have fallen on barren soil. Just last month, a judge ruled, as I said, in New York State uh, that the Attorney General could proceed with its suit against the Trump Foundation for serious allegations of, and I quote the judge, not an informant, failure to operate and manage the Foundation in accordance with corporate and statutory rules and their fiduciary obligations resulting in misuse of charitable assets and self-dealing. Then the New York Times reported that Acting Attorney General Whitaker's former organization um, paid more than $1.2 in dark money from anonymous conservative donors to target and defeat Democrats in elections. Instead, we have our umpteenth hearing on the latest cons Clinton conspiracy theory, and of course, we don't want to look at those charges. There's irony here. My friends, the Republican Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy justified the massive investigations, you will recall, into Hillary Clinton after Benghazi by touting his party's efforts to bring down her poll numbers. That was the motivation. They had eight committees, including this one, and a select committee squandered millions of dollars and found very little. Yet now the Democrats are about to gain control. And Mr. McCarthy now says we should not investigate President Trump. That agenda, he says, would be too small. That would sh we should focus on other problems, like perhaps, once again, the Clintons. The truth is, there are very serious issues we ought to be investigating instead of this one. Chairman Meadows and Ranking Member Cummings sent a letter to the Trump administration seeking documents about their inhumane policy of separating immigrant children at the border. And I applaud you for that, Mr. Chairman, and I supported that effort. We did not get a single document. We were completely stymied. And despite our requests, no subpoenas were issued and no hearings held. Of course, it's the prerogative of the chairman of the full committee to call hearings, and he's chosen to call this one. Unfortunately, I trust, and I think most people, it looks like a last gasp at partisanship. I thank the chair. So I, I thank the gentleman for his opening remarks, and so I'd like to make two very quick clarifications for my good friend, and I mean that in all sincerity. Uh, Mr. Huber's absence here today, if there's no there there, is certainly not an excuse not to be here. I think the chairman would agree with that, because uh, if, if that's the, the benchmark that we're going to use, then all we have to do is hear from them that there's no there there and no one shows up. And, and I don't think that that's consistent on either way. I'd also like to highlight that if indeed we're here a little bit longer, which it appears that we're willing to do, I'm certainly willing to look at, at all of the foundation issues. Um, I've signed on 22 bipartisan letters for oversight, probably uh, the most of any any Republican member uh, in, in that regard, because I believe that oversight done properly is what we need to do. I want to make one clarification. Uh, if we're going to look at foundations, we do need to look at all of them. And I believe that we need to start where it's $2.5 billion on the Clinton Foundation versus $19 million on the Trump Foundation. There's a big disparity there in terms of, of overall revenues. And, and yet, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to cooperating with the new chairman 
uh, not to be presumptuous on, on government operations uh, in the new Congress where we do real oversight. And so I wanted to make sure that, that I clarified that. So, uh, Mr. Fenton, you are recognized for your opening statement. Before we do that, I'm going to have you stand up. Both of you stand, please, Mr. Fenton, Mr. Hackney. If you'll uh, stand and I'll uh, actually uh, ask you, I'm going to swear you in now. And then uh, I'll read your credentials after that. How about if you'll raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear uh, to uh, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Uh, please be seated. Uh, let the record reflect that uh, uh, both witnesses answered in the affirmative. And uh, so we're going to go ahead, Mr. Tom Fenton. You're the president of Judicial Watch. You are hereby recognized for five minutes. If you'll hit the red button. Talk button, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Maddows, and thank you, uh, Mr. Connolly, for conducting this hearing. Uh, Judicial Watch is a conservative, nonpartisan educational foundation dedicated to promoting transparency, accountability, and integrity in government politics and the law. Uh, without a doubt, we're the most active Freedom of Information Act requester and litigator in the nation today. And it's no secret that Judicial Watch has had uh, concerns over the years about the Clinton's ethics and respect for the rule of law. So it was with some skepticism we greeted promises by Hillary Clinton in 2008 and 2009 uh, to conduct herself accordingly or appropriately with respect to the foundation as a condition of her being approved as Secretary of State with some skepticism. At the time, even CNN reported that Bill Clinton's complicated business interests could present future conflicts of interest that result in unneeded headaches for the incoming commander in chief. And to reassure President Obama, and senators from both parties, uh, Mrs. Clinton uh, agreed to uh, part not participate personally and substantially in any particular matter involving specific parties in which the William Clinton Foundation is a party or represents a party. And additionally, the Clintons promised that the president's speeches and business activities would undergo a State Department ethics review and that the Clinton Foundation would disclose its donors online and agree to significant restrictions on support from foreign governments neither of which, to be fair, it wasn't required by law, but was contingent on her being confirmed by the Senate. Uh, we obviously had zero confidence that these promises would be kept, and we began monitoring the ethics process and filed a Freedom of Information Act request in 2011 to see how that ethics process was being implemented. Uh, we were ignored for two years by the administration. We sued in 2013 and found something which ter wasn't terribly surprising to us, but still shocking, that former President Clinton gave 215 speeches and earned $48 million while his wife presided over U.S. foreign policy. Uh, not one of those speeches was uh, deemed a conflict of interest. They cons that also included a consultancy with the controversial Clinton Foundation advisor, Doug Band, uh, the cult with, who ran something called the, the Teneo Group. Uh, that consultancy ended after Teneo was caught up in a failed investment firm known as MF Global. State Department legal advisors approved Bill Clinton's speeches in China, in Russia, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, the UAE, Panama, Turkey, Taiwan, India, the Cayman Islands, and other countries. Uh, the speeches, uh, the approvals were routinely copied to Cheryl Mills, Hillary Clinton's senior counsel and chief of staff, who had been a foundation official, had negotiated the ethics agreement, which raised, again, conflicts of interest issues as to why she was involved in this process at all. Uh, the uh, Documents also show that Mr. Clinton received a staggering sums from Saudi benefactors, specifically 18, between $18 million and $50 million were raised from the Saudis uh, during this time period. While Mrs. Clinton served as Secretary of State, Bill Clinton gave two speeches in Saudi Arabia, earning a total of $600,000. Uh, he spoke at the Global Business Forum in Riyadh, founded by the Saudi Investment Authority, and sponsored by uh, the, the, the Bog Group, a commercial colossus with close ties to the Saudi family. He received $300,000 for that speech. Uh, there was one deal that was turned aside, uh, but the exception in many ways proves the rule uh, that this ethics process was no more than a rubber stamp to allow Bill Clinton to raise money from foreign corporations, mostly controlled or too often controlled by foreign governments. Uh, specifically, also, uh, the documents show that he was approved to speak to something called Renaissance Capital, which is a Russian government-linked firm. 
but it turns out later uh, was connected to the Uranium One issue. Again, approved without uh, for, without comment by the so-called ethics process on the on in the State Department. And then we found the Clinton email server. Judicial Watch litigation, uh, to sum up, found the Clinton email server. Our Freedom of Information Act requests and lawsuits forced the State Department to admit they had all these emails they weren't telling anyone about. And also, who was, another employee of the State Department who was participating in this server was Yuma Abedin, who, uh, according to testimony she gave the Judicial Watch, needed it to conduct to Clinton's personal and family business. And to be sure, documents that we uncovered later as a result of uncovering the Clinton email server uh, show the Clinton Foundation was in regular contact with Aberdeen and others in the State Department uh, to get special favors and treatment for supporters and allies of the Foundation. Specifically, for instance, Gilbert uh, Shigori, who was, uh, was, it, was asked to be put in touch with the State Department's substance person on Lebanon. This was by Doug Ban, the Clinton Foundation official. Ban notes that Shigori is a key guy there, Lebanon, and to us, and insists that Aberdeen call Ambassador Jeffrey Feltman to connect them to Shigori. Uh, Shigori is a close friend of President Clinton, a top donor to the foundation. He appears near the top of the foundation's donors list, gave between one and five million dollars to uh, the foundation and pledged a billion dollars to the Clinton Global Initiative. I don't know if he actually spent the money. He was convicted in 2000 in Switzerland on money laundering. So you can see that the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton State Department, almost immediately broke promises to President Obama and the Senate to maintain a wall of separation between the foundation and the state. We have numerous instances, it's detailed in my written testimony, of uh, pay to play and favoritism for Clinton Foundation supporters with the Clinton State Department. Uh, it's so bad that the Crown Prince of Bahrain couldn't get a meeting directly with Mrs. Clinton through the State Department, so he went through the Clinton Foundation to try to get the meeting. Uh, many have noted that uh, it was hard to tell where the Clinton uh, State Department ended and where the Clinton Foundation began, and this was in response to these disclosures, again, not of insider documents, but government documents that have been hidden from the American people. Uh, then there's the Uranium One controversy, and specifically, uh, it was a controversial 2010 Uranium One deal uh, there were monies that were funneled into the Clinton Foundation by Uranium One interests, specifically uh, uh, Mr. Frank Giestra, and these monies um, result, were, hidden, were hidden from the American people. Uh, the Foundation promised to disclose these monies in, as I said, this earlier agreement, uh, $31.3 million dollars was uh, given to, for instance, the foundation uh, beginning in January 2008, or around the year 2008. We have uh, the new documents, of the document of the Renaissance Capital, $500,000, which is just the tip of the iceberg. And since then, both the New York Times has reported uh, that Uranium One's chairman used his family's foundation to uh, make four donations totaling $2.35 million uh, to the Clinton operation. And of course, as, as I said, this, none of this was disclosed. And shortly after the Russians announced their intention to acquire the stake in Uranium One, uh, Mr. Clinton received that $500,000 speaking fee from the Renaissance Capital Organization. So we're asking for documents for Uranium One. We're getting the proverbial hand to the face from the administration on this. It's unfortunate that even the Trump administration uh, doesn't want to divulge the full truth about this. Uh, but there is enough evidence uh, to warrant serious investigations of the Clinton Foundation. And there is evidence that, uh, in addition to this, that the Clinton Foundation investigations that may have been taking place during the Obama administration were suppressed by the Justice Department. So frankly, it's no surprise the Justice Department isn't here today. Uh, so I look forward to your questions. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Fitton. Uh, Mr. Hackney, uh, you're recognized, and, and so I, I didn't say this, and I should have. If you will try to keep your oral testimony to five minutes, we'll be a little bit generous with you as well. Uh, and uh, you're now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Meadows, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here today to talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, nonprofit oversight. My name is Philip Hackney, and I'm a professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh. I study, write, 
teach and speak about tax law and specialize in nonprofit organizations and particularly with tax exempt organizations. Um, though I am a professor, I worked for five years at the Office of the Chief Counsel um, of the IRS looking over the tax exempt sector. Um, so I bring a wealth of experience. We wrote regulations, oversaw the policy of the IRS, um, and uh, it was a very important time of my life, and I enjoyed the time working with that office. Um, I additionally, before that, worked for Baker Botts, LLP, as a corporate attorney for three years, doing securities work and uh, investigations into accounting irregularities. Um, now, I don't have much time. I've got five minutes. Um, so let me cut to the chase. Uh, this is about oversight of nonprofit organizations. The IRS, as a practical matter, is seen as the nation's primary nonprofit regulator. Though the law is enacted by Congress and the regulations implemented by the IRS and Treasury could be improved, there's a real crisis in nonprofit organization oversight right now, which is that the budget is not sufficient to allow the, the IRS to do the job that needs to do well. It's not there. Um, I have some numbers that you can see in my written testimony. But I'll use one fact from the, uh, there was a great ProPublica piece, I don't know if you, you saw it the other day. It was called, How the IRS Was Gutted, over a period of eight years. And, and, and I'll use one number. The IRS today has fewer than 10,000 auditors. The last time it had that few auditors, 1953, 1953. Um, for reference in terms of the exempt organization sector. This is the folks that are watching over these nonprofits that we're caring about today. They have in the range of 200 auditors, in the range of 200 uh, determination specials that are looking over this sector. So while the IRS presence has shrunk, the nonprofit world has gotten much bigger in that same period of time. There's over three trillion of assets in that sector. And about 5% of GDP takes place in there. There are over 1.8 million organizations that the IRS is overseeing within that world. The nonprofit sector is a terrific force for good. It's an incredible small d democratic effort at solving our problems in our nation's soup kitchens and our churches and in our schools. It's important that there be good oversight of this group. They take care of Americans daily in our lives, and it matters what happens. There are those who take advantage of these organizations or direct the organizations to their own self-interest, carry out their own things that they want to do. The law should be there to stop them from taking those actions. And when I worked at the IRS, they were working hard every day to do that activity. I know folks in state offices who are working hard every day to take care of that activity. But realistically, the amount of money, the resources that are, are just not there. They aren't, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not certain what this subcommittee has in mind, hopes to accomplish through this hearing. A hearing on nonprofit oversight could do real good for this community. I see newspaper stories every day about people taking advantage of charities, and it breaks my heart when I see that happen. If this is going to be a tit for tat, showing this foundation that's conservative did this, or this foundation that's liberal did that, it ain't gonna help us. It just becomes a tit for tat political effort. I'd like to see these nonprofits operating better, and I hope it can be about that. Where's the IRS? Does the IRS have the right rules? Does the IRS have the right resources it needs to conduct the oversight? You're conducting the oversight over the folks who are conducting the oversight, and I don't think those folks have the resources they need, and there probably are things we could do about the laws as well. Almost at the end of my time. Um, let's talk about what role the IRS plays in nonprofits oversight and how we can improve that in function to ideally raise up our nonprofit sector and build confidence in American taxpayers that laws are evenly enforced every day. I'm worried that we have a real crisis on our hands with that nonprofit oversight, not as a matter of bias, 
but it was a matter of just not having the resources to get the job done. They work hard every day, but they don't, can't do everything. We're asking too much of them right now. They need more. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Hackney. Um, and so, so you were at the IRS. You were over the 501C3 through 20, whatever the numbers are, uh, uh, section. Is that yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, worked there from 2006 to 2011, and uh, I was a senior technician reviewer uh, towards the end and uh, wrote regulations into uh, supporting organizations and dealt with, you know. Here in D.C.? 529s. Yes, I was in the national office. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, your former colleagues would be really happy with your opening statement. <laughs> uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, the vice chair of the Subcommittee on Government Operations, Mr. Heiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Fenton, let me, let me begin with you. I, I would assume that you're familiar with the uh, Department of Justice Inspector General report that was re released in uh, February of 2018 pertaining to uh, Andrew McCabe and the conversation he had uh, yes. pertaining to the... the yes. Okay. Um, there's some interesting information that is revealed in uh, that report, specifically a telephone conversation that McCabe had with the principal associate deputy attorney general, possibly Matthew Axelrod, uh, pertaining to the Clinton Foundation. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about in that conversation? Yes. Okay, can you briefly describe what that conversation uh, consisted of? Well, according to the IG report, uh, which I do quote in my testimony, uh, they had this conversation regarding the Clinton Foundation investigation uh, in August of 2016. Uh, McTabe said that the uh, Justice Department expressed concerns about FBI agents taking overt steps in the Clinton Foundation investigation during the president's presidential campaign. According to McCabe, he pushed back asking, are you telling me that I need to shut down a validly predicated investigation? McCabe told us, the IG, uh, that the conversation was very dramatic. He had never had a similar confrontation before with DOJ. But prior to that, senior DOJ officials refused FBI requests to issue subpoenas on Clinton Foundation issues earlier in 2016, according to the reports, and that, um, you know, since then, supposedly there's been a new investigation uh, launched, but I haven't seen any of the indicia of a serious investigation by the Justice Department yet. Well, I would agree that that was a very dramatic conversation, and McCabe said, as you, as you mentioned there, that he had never had a conversation like this uh, as in his career at the FBI. Do you believe that this demonstrates that the uh, Justice Department was actively trying to protect the Clinton Foundation from an FBI investigation. Yeah, it's just one of, I think, a few pieces of evidence uh, demonstrating that the Clinton Foundation was being protected by the Justice Department, especially during that election year. Uh, these pay-to-play allegations, for instance, that we uncovered these emails, they came out in August of 2016. Not that we timed them to come out in August 2016. That was a result of the Justice Department taking you know, eight, nine months to release them to us once, or the State Department taking eight, nine months to release them to us after they received them from Hillary Clinton and Ms. Aberdeen. Uh, but uh, so this was a very tricky time period, and so I can imagine there was pressure on the FBI and Justice so Department why, to do what, something. So what, in your opinion, would be the reason that they were trying to protect the Clinton Foundation? Well, the Justice Department at the time was working with the Clinton campaign to target President Trump. Uh, they were targeting President Trump. Uh, one of the key folks involved in that was Peter Strzok, who's had a demonstrated bias as an FBI official against Mr. Uh, Trump and for, and for Mrs. Uh, Clinton. You know, irony, the irony of the McCabe situation is that McCabe is accused of leaking in pushback to the Justice Department, saying that we are investigating Hillary Clinton, which actually ha happened to be ac inac accurate, but was not something he was supposed to be telling the newspapers. That's why he allegedly lied about leaking to it. Would, uh, would you so, say, so McCabe, me, you know, the, there were some in the FBI who wanted to do this. Would you say it's somewhat, uh, at least calls it some red flags for the Justice Department? It sounds, what you're alleging is that they were actively involved in trying to influence the election. Oh, it sure does. I, I think uh, this is an area that needs to be explored. Um, I wish it had been explored by this Congress. It wasn't sufficiently. 
I know there was pushback from the DOJ, and uh, I know there's all sorts of concerns about uh, uh, foreign interference in our elections, but when you have bureaucracies like the DOJ putting their thumbs on the scales, it's something that both parties ought to be concerned about because, you know, one day the shoe will be on the other foot, uh, politically speaking, and we just want to be able to restrain the agencies from being their own arm of branch of government. So this may be uh, another way of asking a similar question, or at least a similar train of thought. Why would the Justice Department try to pressure the FBI to stop a perfectly valid investigation? Uh, for political reasons. I mean, there were other investigations that were ongoing at the time before the, uh, that, that concerned President Tr or then candidate Trump and Hillary Clinton. Uh, so uh, the complaint about overt steps targeting the foundation seemed to be, well, not credible. Uh, that's why Mr. McCabe reacted so strongly. Well, I believe what you've just said is the whole reason we're here. And Mr. Hackney, although I appreciate your opinion expressing why and how we need to do our oversight, what has just been said is the re precise reason why we are doing oversight. Uh, and uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Georgia. The chair recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Conley, the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I swear, uh, Mr. Pitt, and listen to your testimony. I, I, it's like being an Alice in Wonderland. Um, the idea that why are we here? So let's, let's just put ourselves in context because apparently none of this is happening in the real world. We just had a sentencing hearing in New York in which the president's personal attorney was given three years of jail time. This isn't speculation about what someone might have done. This is a crime admitted to. And in the sentencing, it was identified explicitly that individual number one coordinated and directed this illegal activity for which Mr. Cohen is going to jail. Not speculative, not phony informants, not make-believe whistleblowers, not, not smearing or hearsay. This is now in the court record. You just made light. You almost dismissed, well, Russian interference in our election. That's a pretty big thing. And to compare the idea of uh, somebody putting their thumb on the scales of justice in the Department of Justice to protect the Clintons, even though there's no criminal charge to that effect. And in fact, the FBI did look at it and found no there there, not once but twice, Mr. Comey himself. <laughs> we had Russian interference in our election. All of our intelligence community agrees with that. The FBI agrees with that. Most senior officials in the Trump administration with respect to foreign policy and law enforcement agree with that, except the president. I, I, we, I, have, we have criminal investigations, Mr. Pitton, not about the Clinton Foundation, but about the Trump Foundation. We have a ruling, and I'd like to enter that ruling, Mr. Chairman, into the record, from the Supreme Court of the State of New York saying there is sufficient grounds to go forward with a criminal investigation of the Trump Foundation, not the Clinton Foundation. Without objection. And we're not talking about it here because we're making a political point. Mr. Heiss says that's why we're here. Yes, why we're here is the grand Christmas, Christmas miracle hope that we will distract the American public from the business at hand. That is grave and serious and undermines democratic institutions and norms. And Mr. Fitton, candidly, I would have expected more from Judicial Watch than your testimony. Mr. Hackney. Can I respond briefly? Briefly. The concern is that... I made a statement, but if you wish to respond, I the, will. The, the concern is the investigation of Russia attempts to influence our policy in the United States is geared at focusing on President Trump to the exclusion of what happened to Russian attempts to uh, try to persuade or guarantee a positive result on the Uranium One scandal and Russian uh, admitted uh, efforts by the Clinton campaign uh, to base uh, its dossier that was used to spy on President Trump with allegations generated by Russian intelligence. Yep. I, so if there was a broad investigation into the full panoply of what Russia was trying to do with respect to both parties, I think Americans of both parties would be more I th happy with I that. I think, and unfortunately, because of the issue of time, I'd be glad to 
give you more time later, but um, I would just say this committee, the Republican side, had an informant on the so-called Uranium One thing, and they held him from us for three months, and oh my God, this was going to be explosive testimony. And when we finally got a crack at him on a bipartisan basis, his testimony fell apart. He had no no evidence of criminal activity of any kind. In fact, no evidence of quid pro quo. And here you are repeating a slander that has no factual basis behind it. Meanwhile, we have court evidence, court evidence with respect to what's going on currently. Mr. Hackney, my time is limited, your IRS background. So these two witnesses, Republican witnesses who are litigants to a lawsuit, not whistleblowers, coming next. Um, they wrote the IRS with a one-page summary uh, of their so-called interview with Mr. Kessel. And, and the result, the reaction of the IRS to that request was a denial of the letter, of the request. You know IRS. Why in the world would the IRS deny something like that? What, what, how should we read that? Um, so I... I won't talk specifically to any particular organization or circumstances, but in terms of thinking about the IRS uh, assessment of any particular whistleblower claim, it's going to be um, a number of considerations. Um, particularly, did someone bring actual credible information that leads to something uh, that returns tax dollars in some way? And they must be concluding, forgive me there, uh, if the IRS has made that choice within a whistleblower act, the primary thing must be that no one is bringing something to the table there. Um, and I, I do want to note, I just wanted to say to uh, Vice Chair Heiss, I agree fully that this committee has an important role in oversight. So, I um, and Mr. Chairman, uh, just a unanimous uh, consent request. Uh, thank the Chair. Thank you both for testimony. Um, I would like to enter into the record our correspondence, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our letter to you dated November 29th, uh, requesting the broadening of this hearing, your one point, uh, your one page response to us on December 4th, and our counter to that, our response to that on December 10th. I'd like to enter it into the record. Uh, w without objection. I, I don't, I don't know that I've seen the December 10th letter, but I'm sure I will. Well, I mean, today's the 12th, so maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's in the mail. It's probably <laughs> in the mail. I think my good friend knows I don't play surprises with him. Uh, no, I, 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 I operate on the assumption. And, and that's that why you, you get the grin that I uh, agree with. I thank right, the chair. Thanks. All right. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. For I thank the chairman. I, I just respond to my good friend from Virginia. We're not trying to distract anyone. We're just trying to trying to stop this double standard that exists in our culture today. There's one set of rules for us regular folk, but it looks like to me a different set if, uh, if you're part of the politically connected class. And that's all this is about. And we have two whistleblowers we haven't heard from. We're going to hear from them here in a second. And we'll find out what they have to say and hopefully get to the truth. So be before I come to you, though, Mr. Fitton, I want to go to Mr. Hackney. Mr. Hackney, when did you work at the IRS again? I was in the exempt organization's branch of tax-exempt government entities. In, in what years? Uh, 2006 to April of 2011, I got an opportunity to join the faculty of Louisiana State University Law School, and it was an exciting opportunity. Well, wonderful. We're, we're, we're happy for you. But you were there when the, when the targeting of conservative groups started then, right? Um, apparently it did, but I was not involved in any of that. It says you were head of exempt, advised the commissioner regarding exempt organization requirements. Then it all, this all took place in the exempt, exempt organization division of the, of, uh, the IRS. Uh, but I did not handle anything. Did you know anything about it? I did not handle. You work with Lois Lerner. Um, I did work with Lois. And you did, but you didn't know anything about the be on the lookout list or anything like that. I was not aware of those particular. When did you first find out that the IRS was targeting conservative people and this this whole double standard that I just mentioned was going on right in the very division that you were supposed to be advising and overlooking? Sure, I appreciate the question. Um, so um, I would disagree with characterization uh, of, of targeting, uh, but I was at the meeting. Uh, well, well, you don't think people were targeted? I don't believe they were. I think there was uh, There was a list that had three terms, that time. 9, 12, Tea Party, and uh, Conservative. You, if those, th those terms come up, you got put on the list. Yeah, I, I absolutely appreciate the question, and I uh, You don't think there was targeting the President of the United States I believe the, the IRS was. was doing its best to do its job and didn't have the resources and was trying to find ways of accomplishing This, this wasn't about resources. This is about targeting specific points of view, Mr. I, Hackney. I understand that. The I, Attorney General and the President of the United States had a big press conference when it became public and said, we're going to get to the bottom of this. They talked about possible criminal liability, and you're saying it didn't even exist in the very division that you were head of? I'm, I'm not saying it didn't exist. 
I'm not saying that they were not looking at Tea Party organizations, but I'm also saying that they were looking at many different other organizations, as you'll see from various reports that came out later. That is not true. That is not what the Inspector General uh, said. And, uh, and frankly, if it was just, you know, we were looking at everyone the same. I don't think Lois Lerner would have taken the fifth when she sat right where you were sitting uh, here today. But I got to get to Mr. Fenton in my last two minutes and 30 seconds here. Um, Two billion since 2001, right, uh, Mr. Fitton? That's what the Clinton Foundation took in. Is that right? Uh, Two billion dollars. Numbers like that I've seen. Forty-eight million in speeches. I think you said in your opening statements that, that we did the math. You said like 200 something. That's like quarter million dollars for every single speech. He's pretty good. I mean, I've heard him speak, but that is that is uh, amazing. Uh, and then you said in 2008, when Secretary Clinton became secretary, there was an agreement that that uh, I think in your testimony you said there are certain things she had to do. For the duration of her appointment, she would not be involved in all this money that the Clinton Foundation was taking in and all the speeches that her husband was doing, right? She wouldn't be signing off or making decisions about that. Is that right? Yeah. And the Clinton Foundation would disclose its donors. So there was an agreement that she, had, she worked out when she was Senate confirmed. Right. Okay. Did they follow the agreement? No. And not, not in my view, at least. So they had to get to permission for her to be Secretary of State and continue to do all the things they did. They got permission, they got the okay, and then they didn't follow it. No, they immediately began, the foundation immediately contacted uh, Ms. Abedin, who worked closely with Mrs. Clinton, uh, to start getting things done for foundation supporters, as I've described. And it's not what I described, the emails. So the secretary, started. she kept her part of the deal, but she just had her lawyer, her chief of staff, sign off on everything. Is that sort of how it worked? Yeah, Abedin did the heavy lifting yeah. there, yeah. yeah. Do you think there's a double standard right now in America, Mr. Fitton? Oh, yeah. Mrs. Clinton is being protected by and was protected uh, and, frankly, still is being protected from uh, the consequences of her behavior at the State Department and subsequently. My colleague from Virginia uh, talked about some things that have happened recently with Mr. Cohen, but um, I think it's interesting. I don't, I don't remember anyone associated, during, during the Clinton investigation, I don't know anyone associated with the Clinton um, investigation. Well, for, first of all, they didn't even call it an investigation. Remember what they were told to call it? A matter. Yeah, it was supposed to be called a matter, right? Uh, it was obviously an investigation, but it was told, uh, told to be called a matter. I don't remember Cheryl Mills getting her door kicked in at 5 in the morning and having everything confiscated. I don't remember that at all. In fact, she worked out a deal ahead of time, got immunity before she even turned over any of her records or communications. Is that right? Yeah, I'd like to, you know, I, I, I would just love the committees or someone to investigate. We're doing it separately at Judicial Watch, but uh, to find out whether or not, as report suggests, the foundation investigation the FBI was conducting in 2016 was actively suppressed by the Justice Department and curtailed. You know, public reports are that FBI agents were only able to read newspaper articles as part of their investigation. They were denied subpoenas and other basic tools available to them. Yeah. And when you compare and contrast the special counsel investigation into uh, President Trump and his associates, that's what a real investigation looks like, yeah. abuses aside. We haven't had anything comparable uh, even during the Clinton email issue. Yeah. Certainly this is tied to the Clinton email issue. Mr. Chairman, I know I'm a little over time, but if I, if I could real, real quick, uh, I didn't expect to spend as much time on Mr. Hackney denying that there was targeting at the IRS. Um, but you're, you're, I think, exactly right. I, I've never seen this happen, Mr. Fitton, where the director of the FBI is fired, the deputy director is fired, the chief legal counsel is demoted, then leaves. FBI counsel Lisa Page is demoted, then leaves. And Peter Strzok, deputy head of counterintelligence at the FBI, is demoted and then fired. I've never seen that happen. But what's interesting, those are the same people who ran the Clinton investigation and started and launched the Russian investigation. Never seen that happen to any other federal agency, even as bad as the IRS was. They only had a couple of people, and none of them got fired. They just left. They're still getting a pension. So I've never seen anything like that. And the other thing that always strikes me as sort of interesting, and I'll close with this if I could, Mr. Chairman, is the names they gave the investigations, right? The Clinton investigation was the mid-year exam. But the, the investigation into possible coordination between the Trump campaign and Russia was crossfire hurricane. I like that. Just, just the name suggests a completely different approach and a completely different standard in how they're going to run the investigation. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The, the uh, chair recognizes the gentlewoman from New York uh, for a very generous five minutes. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I thank both panelists and my colleagues for being here. Uh, the, the Clinton Foundation is located in the district that I'm privileged to represent, so I've been able to attend many of their functions, conferences, uh, to see firsthand some of the outstanding work that they are doing in New York and in my district. Uh, the, the Foundation has supported physical education programs in uh, 149 schools. Uh, projects are underway to restore New York's Harbor, provide free job training for homeless female veterans, and help hundreds of high school seniors prepare, prepare for graduation and college. And I, I have a whole list of things I would like to ask unanimous consent to put in the record their activities, Mr. Chairman, in uh, my district in New York and across the country. Without objection. Now, now uh, I, I find it very ironic in this hearing today that the Republicans are targeting the Clinton Foundation, which is headed by two people who are out of office, who are not in government, yet there are other foundations where people are in government in very high positions, the Trump Foundation, the Whitaker Foundation, that they are not investigating. So I would suggest that we should be also investigating those foundations. So uh, Professor Hackney, I'd like to ask you about uh, some of the allegations uh, concerning the Whitaker uh, Foundation, now the acting attorney general. Um, and uh, before uh, arriving at the Justice Department, he was the president and executive director of the Foundation for Accountability and Civic Trust, FACT. His uh, charity was supposed to be focused on promoting ethics and transparency, and thus they had a tax-exempt uh, status. But last month, the New York Times uh, reported that FACT was paid more than $1.2 in so-called dark money from undisclosed conservative donors. So, Professor Hackney, can you describe and explain dark money? What is it? And are there any concerns about when dark money is used to fund nonprofits like this one? Absolutely. Um, so uh, dark money is a name given to money that comes into nonprofit organizations that are tax exempt, um, but nobody can see, uh, at least the public can't see this uh, money. Um, so uh, particular dark money organizations are social welfare organizations. Uh, these are advocacy organizations. Um, they carry out work that uh, often can take uh, the look of politics but may <laughs> stay away from uh, moving into FEC. Um, as a result of not engaging in electoral activity where they'd have to disclose under campaign finance law, um, this money comes into a C4, C5, C6, labor unions, uh, business leagues, and social welfare organizations. Um, and in the past, uh, the, the IRS at least knew because the, there was a disclosure on Schedule B. Uh, the IRS recently uh, removed that, so not even the IRS knows. Uh, this means that we don't know who's funding particular uh, advocacy work that is moving towards elect particular candidates. It's dark. Okay, well, we have legislation which we hope to pass as our first bill when we take over in January, which would disclose where this money is coming from. And that's not all. Uh, last month, uh, Mr. Whitaker uh, released uh, fi his financial disclosure form that showed that he received 900000 over that <coughs> From, from his foundation in 2016 and 2017. That's over half a million dollars a year. Are you aware of what he did to deserve that kind of salary, uh, Mr. Hackney? Um, I, I'm not going to speak to any particular organization, as I indicated. Um, well, then are there regulations that govern absolutely. how much in salary? With, with, uh, a, with, a, with a 501c3, uh, the organization must pay a reasonable salary um, and uh, in order to uh, determine what a reasonable salary is, you're supposed to go and look at what other people in a like spot are playing. Now, this is assuming that you are doing particular work and so on. It, it has to be a full facts and circumstances analysis of the work. Well, can you explain what laws fact this, this uh, Whitaker Foundation may have uh, violated? Um, again, not going to talk specifically to... Um, uh, fact in particular. Um, one interesting aspect you had mentioned, there was a, a, a fund that came through. 
Um, and I, th I think it's worth mentioning uh, donor advised funds here. Um, in uh, donor advised funds are accounts that individuals are able to set up with places like Fidelity and uh, community foundations in the area. They're able to take an immediate deduction, but money doesn't necessarily flow to charitable purposes right away. Um, the interesting thing with a, a um, donor advised fund is that it is a public charity and it can be used to make a um, charity that is would otherwise be a private foundation into a public charity. I, I would love to uh, have an opportunity to talk about that. That was an, ele an element of the private foundation regs. Uh, when an organization has one person that's donated a lot of money to them, we put them into private foundations instead, and they have restrictive rules that apply to them. This donor advised fund move allows organizations to avert these private foundation rules. Well, I think we should change that with law, too. Now, also, it showed that the FAC paid at least 500000 to a Republican research firm known as America Rising. And according to its website, the mission of this uh, organization is, quote, to help its clients defeat Democrats, end quote. Aren't, aren't 5, 5013C supposed to be nonpartisan? So I'll, I'll talk to that. Um, there are two major rules that come in with in 501c3s. One, no electoral activity. You go out and say, uh, elect uh, uh, Ms. Baloney or elect uh, Chairman Meadows, uh, you'll lose your exemption, technically. Um, you also have limitations on lobbying. Um, what often happens in this space and that gets confusing is there's a concept of education. If you're doing it in the context of a school, fine. If it's moving into another space, you can get into difficult spaces, and it's a very well, hard area for you. My time is uh, coming to an end, but this uh, website, and I find this very disturbing, says that they gauge, this is in the website, you can go look it up today, quote, the relentless pursuit of original and effective hits against Democrats, end quote. This does not sound like a nonpartisan 5013C to me. It sounds like a political operative. I, I personally think that this uh, uh, should be investigated. And do you believe, uh, Professor, that further investigation into fact uh, and its uh, tax-exempt status is, is uh, warranted and how they were spending their money and why they were spending their money? Professor, yeah, and I don't want to speak specifically the, to Her time has expired. You can uh, answer But that. let me just say that the Republicans have refused uh, to, to investigate current officials and current people who have these not-for-profits, and they are obsessed with continuing uh, to investigate the Clintons many years after they have been in office. And, uh, right. and I think we the, should have investigations on these other two foundations, uh, their tax-exempt The gentlewoman's status. time has expired. And the Thank chair, you, Mr. The chair Chairman. has been extremely gracious with both sides, and so I'm going to recommend that we stay with our five-minute timeline, uh, starting with you, the gentleman from, Ohio, uh, from Iowa, uh, Mr. Blum, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meadows. Thank you to our panelists uh, for being here today. Quid pro quo. I had to look it up. Uh, it's Latin for something for something. A favor granted in return for something. In 2016, the Clinton Foundation received a $28 million donation from Morocco's King Mohammed. And shortly thereafter, Secretary of State Clinton relaxed, relaxed U.S. foreign aid restrictions on Morocco. Mr. Fitton, was that a quid pro quo? Was that just a coincidence? Uh, that's, that's the matter that needs to be investigated. Uh, the foundation, the Clinton Foundation, and its associated, uh, the Global Initiative, was able to raise tons of money uh, during Mrs. Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State. And um, some of that was purely charitable, there's no doubt. It was purely charitable activities the foundation engaged in, as Congressman Maloney hi hi highlighted. Uh, but when you have these foreign governments making massive donations to the foundation and major corporations making massive foundations to the foundation, many sometimes of which were out of line with other charitable activities, I think it's a fair question to ask what were they expecting in return, and was it a charitable enterprise or were they just buying insurance? Now that may, or just making sure that they're, they're, uh, they would get a better hearing uh, at, at, uh, over certain policies, but 
Does it mean anything happened illegally? I don't know, but no one's asking the question. Laureate University, $17.6 million to President Clinton, while Hillary was, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, to be the honorary chancellor. I did not know that paid so well. Mm -hmm. We the, asked the founder at that university has another organization called International Youth Foundation that received $40 million in grants while Secretary Clinton was in, in office. After she left office, the grants went from $40 million to a little over $3 million. Is that a coincidence, you think, Mr. Fenton? I don't know. You have to ask, you have to ask the question. And this is why Mrs. Clinton promised these disclosures, and which makes it so problematic that certain these disclosures weren't followed as they were supposed to have been. A Ukrainian. We asked the State Department, give us the agreement. What did Mr. Clinton do, agree to do in exchange for that enormous amount of money? Uh, but that portion was blocked out by the State Department. A Ukrainian oil and steel magnate, Mr. Uh, Pinchuk, donated between 10 to 25 million to the Clinton Foundation. In return, he was offered priority access to the State Department. Mr. Fenton, would you say it's quid pro quo? It uh, certainly seems that way. And then lastly, and I know your organization has uh, done some work on this, Mr. Fenton, the Uranium, uranium One deal. Uh, the, those interests involved in that deal contributed more than $140 million to the Clinton Foundation. Mr. Fenton, could you uh, fill this, uh, uh, this organization in on what happened in return? for that $140 million in contributions? Well, the State Department, in addition to other agencies, approved uh, the goal of those entities, which was to uh, get this stake in Uranium One. And uh, again, the FBI was looking into it, and the allegation is the FBI investigation uh, was curtailed and uh, silenced, or at least aspects of it were silenced from public disclosure to protect uh, the Clintons and the Obama administration generally from uh, controversy on this. And again, another area for investigation. In your opinion, how, how, do, how would that happen? How would it be silenced? How would it be curtailed? How could that happen? You don't pursue certain leads. Uh, you undercharge, in the case of the Uranium One, I think the allegations were that some folks were being charged and a lot of issues were being left out of the documents or the charging documents or the cases that would have embarrassed them. Uh, so uh, whether that, all that is true or not, I don't know, because the Justice Department is giving us the documents. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have 33 seconds left, let the record reflect. In Iowa, we have a saying, if it looks like a pig, if it sounds like a pig, and if it smells like a pig, it's probably a pig. And I think, based on what I read today, something smells here. I yield back my time. I, I thank the gentleman from Iowa. The uh, chair recognizes the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to establish what the standard should be. We understand here we had a president of the United States on the one hand and a secretary of state on the other. It was a unique situation. So the absence of a standard is pretty clear. So we've got to look at the modus operandi for uh, the foundation itself. Uh, because they were bound to be uh, uh, <laughs> instances in which a foundation would look as though it was receiving some favoritism. Uh, and that's, that's what happens, I suppose, when you have two very prominent people operating at this high corridor. So I, I thought I'd look at um, um, internal reviews by the Clinton Foundation. Um, now, these were voluntary reviews, and that's what interested me. Um, apparently, the foundation noted some issues that there weren't as many governing board meetings as there should be. Um, there was not timely reporting of conflicts of interest. Those are the kinds of things that might have been found by some investigation. But these were found by voluntary 
internal reviews by the foundation itself. Here again, I'm looking for a standard as, high, as to how a uh, foundation should act in this kind of situation. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Hackney, uh, do you think the kinds of internal <coughs> reviews um, that were conducted uh, by the Clinton Foundation are, are best practices? Is that how it should be done? So I, again, I don't want to speak specifically to the Clinton Foundation, but as someone who actually goes out and trains uh, directors to be directors of nonprofits, um, I certainly encourage uh, rigorous and engaged discussion of a board. A board should be engaged in what's going on. Um, the nature of uh, various businesses is you'll have problems. I'm sure each of the members have had challenges in their organizations that they run, um, and it's important to do that kind of oversight. I deeply appreciate, as uh, uh, Mr. Heiss had noted, this committee is important. Doing the oversight is really important. It makes a difference in the functionality both of the government well, and I'm, the I'm operations the, I, I, out there. Thank you very much. That goes well beyond my question. Yep. Um, now, you look at the review that, that the Clinton Foundation did, it's fair to ask well, what resulted. And here I am informed that they updated their conflict of interest policy. They reformed their vetting and gift acceptance policy. Uh, I'm not asking you to look <laughs> at those particular reforms in a context you don't have. But are those the kinds of reforms or changes, <coughs> I apologize for this call, that you would expect uh, a, a charity to make after commissioning reforms of the kind that I have just So again, <laughs> not as the Clinton Foundation, but I highly recommend a good conflict of interest policy and a good gift acceptance policy. They're critical to a nonprofit operation. So that was always given the fact that one was the president and one was the secretary, had been the president and one had been the secretary of state. You can see how difficult this situation was. Some employees who were interviewed uh, uh, had, in fact, this is information the committee has received, raised concerns about donors uh, who might have an expectation of a quid pro quo benefit in return for gifts. Again, this is almost inherent in these two high-level officials operating in the same space. On the other hand, no evidence of a quid pro quo was ever found. Um, so I have to ask you that, uh, let me speak as a member of Congress. Uh, I'm sure that when some uh, give uh, contributions to me, they have an ex expectation of a quid pro quo. <laughs> Does that mean that I am, am, am in fact, uh, guilty of some uh, aura of quid quo quo for accepting such contributions? So again, as to uh, uh, nonprofits uh, watching out for uh, people wanting things from you in return is a big part of what you have to worry about in the basic nonprofit, and it becomes much more extreme as you have individuals who have additional power involved. It's a critical question they all have to ask. And it, it is, and, and I can see the space in which, which these two <laughs> were operating, Clinton and the Clinton Foundation and the Secretary of State. <laughs> Mr. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, could I note for the record that uh, the Clinton Foundation <laughs> has received ratings, four out, uh, four out of four star stars from Charity Navigator Platinum rating from Godstar, an A rating from Charity Watch, an accreditation from the Better Bureau, B Business Bureau for meeting all 20 of its standards of governance, effectiveness, financing, and fundraising. Thank you very much. I, I thank the gentlewoman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gozar, for five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good seeing you, Mr. Fedden. Thank you. Now, is it true that the most recent filings for the Clinton Foundation have shown a significant drop-off in donations now that they have no political power? I haven't seen the filings themselves, but uh, there have been reports that there's been a 62 percent drop-off in donations. So Sidney Blumenthal, a known political operative, was retained by the Clinton Foundation, correct? 
Yes, I recall he was getting paid at ten thousand dollars a month by the Clinton Foundation. So now, while he was getting a rather large paycheck from the Clinton Foundation, he was also in Libya serving as then Secretary Clinton's unofficial advisor. Correct? Uh, according to the New York Times and documents, I think disclosed uh, as a result in part by Judicial Watch's efforts, he sent Mrs. Clinton twenty-five memos on Libya. He was also pushing his own financial interest by trying to get contracts. Correct? Uh, yes, at a court, uh, he worked for the Clinton Foundation and he had business concerns in Libya, it's been reported. Is there an ethical concern with a known political operative working for a supposed nonprofit that is pushing for a war that he can profit from? Well, maybe. I think the public interest here is that Mrs. Clinton promised she'd stay out of Clinton Foundation business, and she immediately and secretly started taking advice from a Clinton Foundation official. Sidney Blumenthal. Now, as we turn this body over to the opposition party here and they launch fake investigations into foreign influence, I would like to take time, take some time to ask the panel about real foreign influence because I know they're not going to. Now, we continually see foreign governments and foreign entities funnel millions of dollars to environmental groups, two of the largest environmental groups in the world, the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Sierra Club have received millions in grants from the Sea Change Foundation. The Sea Change Foundation itself got millions from a Bermuda company linked to Russia. As we all know, the environmental groups have undermined the energy sector in the United States. They've even got fracking banned in the cash-strapped state of New York. Now, if my friends across the aisle, the media and Mr. Mueller, were truly interested in Ru Russian interference, would it make sense to start there, Mr. Fitton? Oh, I've seen reports about that. The Russians obviously have an interest in um, making sure that competitors uh, are harmed in the energy sector, and I'm surprised it has gotten more attention, their involvement in the environmental movement here in the United yeah. States. So Russia money affecting U.S. policies that Russia benefits, uh, uh, it's incredible. In my other committee, the Natural Resources Committee, we're trying to investigate the relationship between the National, Natural Resources Defense Council and their links to communist China government. The NRDC has gotten cozy with the environmental, un, environmentally unfriendly Chinese government while suing the U.S. government whenever it can, particularly the U.S. Navy and its weapon development programs. Now, I'm sure I don't need to remind anyone here that China sees the U.S. Navy as its greatest foe. Mr. Fitton, should a nonprofit be made to register as a foreign agent if it is taking funds and orders from a foreign government that is trying to harm U.S. national and energy security? Maybe. Uh, one of the things I noted about the Clinton Foundation activities is that Doug Bann and others were always advocating on behalf of foreign nationals, which raised an issue of the Foreign Agents Registration Act as well. Uh, but certainly, if my understanding of the law is that there would be registration requirements potentially if uh, you're essentially taking orders from a foreign government and beholden to them financially. Hmm. Now, nonprofits like the Open Society Foundations have been giving billions from wealthy benefactors. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, while there's nothing wrong with someone giving their money to an organization like Open Society, there is a problem when the federal government doles out millions of dollars in grants to these organizations. For instance, the National Immigration Law Center received hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants from the federal government and over one million from the Open Society Foundation while working against U.S. interests. Does it make sense to dole out taxpayer funds to groups that not only look to erode U.S. sovereignty, but are against official U.S. positions, Mr. Fenton? Well, I think it's controversial. I think my, what also would be controversial is that the Soros operation and Mr. Soros's foundations, I think, is going to spend about a billion dollars this year, as you point out, mostly of his own money, is subsidized in part by U.S. tax dollars. And he's a controversial figure in terms of his policy outlooks and I, I question why it is tax dollars are supporting them. It's definitely the one last comment, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman. You know, when we start looking at nonprofits, I actually was part of a nonprofit, and you rated about how much of your dollar goes to the mission statement of what you uh, 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 detail. 
Uh, so, for example, a good nonprofit, 97 cents of every dollar goes to that mission statement. And I listened to Mr. Hackney, I now noticed that the Clinton Foundation was very top-heavy with a lot of uh, employees, a lot of exorbitant travel, and, and not really um, a, a dollar-wise penny spent. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair recognizes uh, Ms. Watson Coleman for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Mr. Fitton, let me ask you something very quickly. Before your position was Judicial Watch, what were your various jobs? I worked for other conservative nonprofits, uh, Accuracy and Media. Have you ever worked for government? Government? No. Well, back when I was a kid, I worked for the town, but... Not, Have you not. ever worked for a Republican elected official? No. Thank you. I've always worked in the nonprofit sector. Thank you. Today, uh, we're holding this hearing again. This is another hearing in a multi-year investigation of the Clinton Foundation completely on um, uh, unsubstantial allegations. But at the same time, we refuse to do anything, not I, to investigate various serious allegations related to the Trump administration, Foundation, both. Last month, the state judge in New York ruled that prosecutors could proceed with legal action against the Trump Foundation for allegations focusing on, and I quote, the misuse of charitable assets and self-dealing, close quote. Let me read from that judge's ruling, quote, petitioners also, the petitioner also alleges that charitable assets, primarily consisting of money donated by outside sources, were used to promote Mr. Trump's properties purchase personal items, advance Mr. Trump's presidential election campaign, and settle certain personal legal obligations. Professor, is the judge's ruling an indication that the allegations against the Trump Foundation are creditable? Um, so uh, I don't want to speak directly to Trump speak Foundation. Speak to the, whether or not you, your pers per perspective on the judge's yeah, I mean, when a judge finds something, that is a finding in uh, the public record. It becomes a part of the public record. And how, well, what was your sort of reaction to this notion of self-dealing? Um, so, I, again, don't want to speak specifically to the Trump Foundation. It's a major issue within private foundations when wealthy individuals put significant money and use it for their own purposes. But so that's you, not as to the Trump would you Would you agree that this is this foundation, this Trump Foundation, is worthy of congressional oversight? Um, I believe the entire nonprofit sector is worthy of oversight. I that think would it's include really this foundation. Absolutely. Professor, on June 15th, you wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about the Trump Foundation. In that piece, you wrote, and I quote, as a former attorney for the chief counsel of the IRS who specialized in nonprofit organizations, I believe Mr. Trump is also criminally li liable for his actions. If I was still at the IRS based on the lawsuit, I would take a criminal, I would make a criminal referral on charges of tax evasion or false statements on a tax return or both. Why specifically do you believe Mr. Trump is criminally liable for his actions regarding the Trump Foundation? And how serious do you consider the crimes of tax evasion or making false statements on tax returns? So again, I'm not going to speak to the Trump Foundation here. My writing speaks for itself. And uh, it, it, let me uh, ask you a question about that. Sure. You wrote an op-ed article. You're here testifying, and there have been specific questions to you. Why are you suddenly unwilling to answer specifically regarding <clears> the? The, the, the purpose for which we are here today. And, and, We're the, not here and, the, and the chair would weigh in on this. Let, let me just say that the gentlewoman makes a point. If, if you've written an op-ed, you can't all of a sudden, as much as I might like you to not comment on it, <laughs> you, you can't not do that. Yeah. I mean, she's asking a legitimate question. You need to, you need to answer it, Mr. Hackney. Let me go there. Um, so charity matters deeply. And it matters deeply that the people who file returns uh, take care to do the things that they intend to do. So, Professor. Um, and when they take that money, and if they use it in ways over a series of years that's problematic, um, and they sign that return, in those instances, 
um, where it is over a period of time, I think that's significant and does warrant so a discussion of So do you believe what you wrote? I do. Do you stand by what you wrote? I stand by what I wrote. Okay. In your op-ed, you also are quoted as saying, the IRS saves criminal consequences for notorious and continuous violations of the law. And the misuse of a charity for personal and political purposes over the years, as alleged by the New York State Attorney General, is in fact the type of case that the IRS goes after with criminal sanctions. What notorious and continuous violations of the law were you referring to that you believe that were committed by the Trump Foundation? And so, Mr. Hackney, her, her time has expired, but you can answer the question. Um, just very quickly, there's been a series of uh, representatives, and I, I, I did not study up for that specifically right now, but there's been a series of representatives have used their charities. There was even one recently, I think, out of my state of Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm not positive about that, but there have been a series of ones that uh, the IRS has brought in those contexts. Thank you. You know, Professor, you have frustrated me. Uh, I because apologize. You are, you are a uh, person who has written what you believe. You are a professor. You are a scholar. You have a former IRS employee. And then you, do, you can't even feel comfortable in supporting what you've already said in writing. With that, I yield back. I do support it. Uh, the chair recognizes himself for a series of questions. Mr. Hackney, let me follow up on Ms. Watson Coleman. Uh, how many, how many uh, pages of the documents the Trump Foundation and their filings have you reviewed? Um, I've reviewed all of their 990 PFs over a long period yeah, of time. Yeah, but 990 doesn't oh, tell the sorry, whole story. Sorry. <laughs> the, the tax returns that the IRS has filed. I've also reviewed the public record in terms of uh, the reports made by David Berenthold. In, in terms of their in terms of what is their internal documents. Would you be qualified to provide an audit in terms of what they've done or not done based not on sure the documents the you've re reviewed? I, I'm not certain of the question. Based on the documents you've reviewed, yep. would you be qualified to be able to give an opinion on an audit of the Trump Foundation? Um, so I think you're asking um, have I seen every single possible document out there? And I, I have not seen every possible document out there. Um, I'm doing based on what the public record is, um, and that's, that, that was it that I had done in that. that so based on public record, you're saying that there's enough in the public record to say that there should be a criminal referral, Mr. Hackney? You know, you're a law professor. I mean, I would find that just unimaginable. I, I think that's different than saying that he's definitely... Uh, in, it in is there, I discussed but, to the fact that... Uh, but my question remains, are you saying there's enough in a public domain to refer it as a criminal matter? I believe there were, um, in the instance and you're, where... You're under oath, so I, I understand. And, and you're a law professor, so I, I, I want to see your students uh, be able to answer this accurately. Absolutely. I believe where we know that there is a high likelihood that there have been false statements in return and there have been choices. And how do you know that? Um, it appears that there were false statements. Appears and no are two different words. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, so you don't know? I, I believe based on the public record, and that was what I was writing it based upon. So based on a public record, you think there's enough for a criminal referral? I believe that uh, in that report, that there was enough to show uh, possible problems there. But I, again, I don't want to go into that, and I'm, I did not prepare to talk to specific facts. This hearing was called at the last minute, and I have not had that time. Well, you as a witness were called at the last minute by the minority, so I just want to make sure that that's clear. I, okay. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. So let me, uh, let me go a little bit further. Mr. Fenton, I want to, want to talk about, everybody's talking about how great the Clinton Foundation is and how above board and A ratings and, and platinum ratings and gold ratings and all of this. Uh, there is a report from November 10th of 2008, which is an internal audit. It actually comes from an internal audit that has a conclusion, it says, the challenges and deficiencies plaguing the foundation cannot be overstated. There are real uh, and undermine the organization's effectiveness immediately and more long term. To address these issues that 
present immediate threats, the foundation should revamp its legal and HR operations, should review its governance structure and documents, and should have an open and honest discussion with the president about the future of the foundation. Would you not find that alarming if that was the conclusion of an internal audit, Mr. Fitt? I wouldn't want to get an audit like that. So, it, it, you know, the problem is there's another audit in 2000. Yeah, you got a microphone. Oh, there was another audit in 2011 that raised some of the same issues. Well, uh, that's not, not as directly, but suggesting. Well, that that's where happened. I was going, and I appreciate you mentioning that because that was in 2010, and then another audit in 2011, as you talked about, by a very different firm, talked about the potential conflicts of interest and the fact that those conflicts of interest policies that were, were suggested to be put in place. However, this is a quote, however, we did not find any evidence of the enforcement of the conflict of evidence, uh, a conflict of interest. Are you saying that in your discovery process with FOIA that there is a potential conflict of interest between the charitable mission of the Clinton Foundation and what might have been going on. Have you found that? Uh, yes. Uh, Mrs. Clinton and Mr. Clinton and the foundation recognized those potential conflicts of interest and uh, tried to reassure the President Obama and the Senate that they would be taken care of and uh, disclosed. And uh, as I said, they were either rubber stamped or key aspects of it weren't disclosed. And uh, or in the case of Mrs. Clinton, she directly started violating her own agreement by dealing with the Sidney Blumenthal and, and allowing her staff to, on a regular basis, take care of Clinton Foundation interests using public resources. Mr. Fenton, is it likely, based on reports that you've seen, is it likely that the special counsel is also looking into uh, things other than Russian collusion narratives for President Trump, based on reports that you've read? Are they looking into other matters as it relates to President Trump? Oh, yes. I would assume the Southern District investigation, the campaign finance allegations that have been raised up there were as a result initially of uh, interest from the special Is it Trump. likely that they're looking into uh, the Trump Foundation as well? It wouldn't surprise me. Okay. Oh, what... Based on your testimony, I guess what I'm trying to figure out, if, if the special counsel is looking at that, why would uh, Attorney General Eric Holder um, not have looked into some of the issues as it related to the Uranium One deal? Uh, and, and why would they have looked the other way? Because apparently, according to your testimony, they did not know whether the FBI or DOJ ever alerted the committee members to criminal activity that they uncovered. And that was a, a quote from your written testimony. The investigation was ultimately supervised by... U.S. Attorney Rod Rosenstein and Andy McKay. Isn't it amazing how these names continue to show up? Isn't it amazing? And with that, if there's no further business before this panel, uh, we will uh, excuse you two gentlemen. We thank you for your testimony, and we'll ask the next panel uh, to be set up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, he's Doyle. He's Doyle. I'm Moynihan. So he wants to switch, or what do you want us to do? Sure. 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 Oh, yeah. 
The Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will come to order. I'm pleased to introduce our second panel, uh, Mr. Lawrence W. Doyle, Managing Partner of DM Income Advisors, and Mr. John F. Moynihan, Principal at JFM and Associates. Um, welcome to you all. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify, so if you will please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the whole, uh, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. I do. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, let the record reflect that uh, the witnesses answered in the affirmative in order to allow time for uh, discussion and, quite frankly, for a Q&A that you'll get quite a bit of. Your entire written statement will be made part of the record. Uh, but we would ask that you would limit your oral uh, testimony or o opening remarks to five minutes. There's a clock in front of you to remind you of that. Uh, it'll turn yellow when you have 30 seconds left. And if you'll please uh, uh, make sure that uh, you press the button when you're speaking. Uh, and so what we will do is is we can we can you know have your o opening testimony a combined 10 minutes so however you want to uh, to do that uh, and so Mr. Mr. Doyle will come to you first and then we, you can yield to Mr. Monahan. I would like to yield to Mr. Moynihan to open please. Okay so uh, Mr. Moynihan uh, you are recognized for up to 10 minutes. Then. Thank you chairman. I'd like to thank you chairman Meadows and other members of the committee for having us here today. My name is John Moynihan, and I'm one of three partners that engaged in this investigative effort involving a 501c3, and in particular, the Clinton Foundation, the subject of today's hearing. Please note that we do many investigations into 501c3s, and this is just one of many. When I'm finished, I'd like to introduce my two colleagues that are here today, Mr. Doyle, and if it's possible, Mr. Thomas Ragland from the Clark Hill Law Firm. Tom has been very active with us in, in our efforts. As we move through this, at the conclusion of Mr. Doyle's introduction, I would like to answer two questions for the committee. Who are we, and why did we do this? I think they'll give some good color and background as to what we're doing, how we do this for a living, um, what our motivations are, and why we're here. 
I'd like to give at this point some special thanks to three other individuals who worked on this matter. Mr. Robert Nieves, who's behind me. He was a senior SES executive in the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, where I worked for many years with Mr. Nieves on money laundering and financial crimes. Mr. John Shiro from the law firm of Bowditch and Dewey. He's a master tax analyst, fiduciary, and trust advisor in the field of taxation and investments. And Mr. Thomas Scannell, an attorney at a law firm in Massachusetts, who is a litigator who challenged us the entire process, our evidence, and the way we went about this to ensure the integrity of what we're going to talk about today. At this time, I'd like to yield to Mr. Doyle. Congressman Meadows and members of the committee, thank you very much for the invitation to present and discuss the topic relating to the oversight of nonprofit organizations with a specific case study on the Clinton Foundation. My name is Larry Doyle, and for purposes of background, John Moynihan and I are the two proudest graduates of the College of the Holy Cross. The Jesuit-inspired Jesuit pursuit of the truth, competitiveness, and playing by the rules have been our calling cards and our commitment throughout John's career in and around law enforcement and mine on Wall Street. For the last 10 years, I have spent countless hours involved in literary and investigative pursuits related to regulatory failure. The comparisons I see between the subprime mortgage market, lack of ratings and regulatory performance, and the Madoff scandal to, to, to today's topics are stark. On that note, I welcome providing the following context and perspective for today's hearing. There are currently approximately 1.75 million not-for-profit organizations in our nation today. 90% of these not-for-profits fall within the 501c subset, while close to two-thirds are 501c3 public charities. Recent data highlights that these not-for-profits annually gener generate approximately 1.74 trillion, with a T, dollars, a 250% increase over the last 20 years, equating it to approximately 9% of our nation's GDP. On a standalone basis, this segment of our economy would be the 10th largest economy in the world, all of which begs the question, who's minding the store, looking out for the donors, and upholding the rule of law? Let us quick, do you want to introduce Tom? Yeah, at this point, at this point Mr. Chairman, would like Mr. Ragland to introduce himself. Uh, Thomas Ragland from the Park Hill Firm. At this point, I'd like to answer two questions. Who are we? We are apolitical. We have no party affiliation to this whatsoever. No one has financed us. I don't know Chairman Meadows. I just met him today. I don't know any of you people, okay? I'm happy to meet you, but we have no relationship to any of you, okay? We are forensic investigators that approached this effort in a nonpartisan, professional, objective, and independent way. We have never been partisan. We come from law enforcement and Wall Street, where each of us has dedicated our entire lives and careers to the rule of law, doing the right thing, pursuing facts. We follow facts. That's all. None of this is our opinion. I emphasize none of this is our opinion. These are not our facts. They are not your facts. They are the facts of the Clinton Foundation. Why did we do this? This is our profession. People will ask us, are you doing this for money? The answer is yes. This is how we make a living. We do cases. It's that simple. We are forensic investigators, former U.S. law enforcement and private practice, making our living conducting these cases. We did not choose this topic because of who the individuals are or were. In fact, we applaud the efforts of the philanthropic nature of the Clinton Foundation on some of the efforts that they have done. That's not in dispute. We're not here to dispute that. Rather, we have backgrounds in 501c3 charities, including work for both inside and outside of them. We know the risks and the frequent shortfalls. 501c3, 501c3s have been found to be particularly vulnerable to abuse. 
and a lack of oversight, especially on the global front. We share a deep and profound commitment to protecting taxpayer dollars. In that context, we saw the controversy surrounding this entity, as well as the significant amount of monies, including U.S. tax dollars, that were flowing through this foundation. We decided and financed out of our own pocket to examine this ourselves. We also firmly believe that no one is above the rule of law, regardless of party, and those who occupy senior positions in our government owe a special duty. It's important to stress that we have not made any conclusions, and to set the record straight, we do not have a lawsuit against anybody. We don't have a complaint against anybody. We have a submission of probable cause to the IRS. That said, we use the FOIA quite substantially and other tools at our disposal to gain quite a bit of uh, public and non-public information. All of the information was obtained completely legally and through the various tools of investigation that we have. At this time, what we would like to do in an expeditious fashion is to state in bullet form the process we went through and to state our findings that are in our submission to the IRS. It is a complex issue, there's significant amount of information, but let it be said, our claim is a tax claim. It's a claim of probable cause indicating that the foundation operated outside the bounds of its approval that came from the IRS. That's our claim. Yeah. You have two minutes. Yep. If we could read our investigative process to you kind of in quick fashion, here's what we did. We went to the 990s. We're financial investigators. We started with the returns that the foundation filed, not that we filed, not that you filed, that they filed. These were their revenue sources and their expenses. We attempted to reconcile all of those donations with expenses. The basis of our claim is we were unable to do that. Larry, go ahead. On that note, we followed the money, so we made extensive spreadsheets of their revenues and expenses. We analyzed their income statements, and we did a macro review of all their donors, which are, it's a very barbelled sort of uh, foundation. Less than one-tenth of one percent of the donors gave 80 percent of the money. So we followed the money. We further went and looked at uh, consent decrees that were issued against the foundation by various states. We reviewed the responses from all the states in which they operated to specific questions about violations, consent decrees, or penalties that they may have paid to those states. We did an analysis of that. The results are quite shocking. In addition to that, we sourced contracts, MOUs, and uh, interaction with foreign governments, including email exchanges between senior foundation executives and government officials. Additionally, we did a review of all their foreign offices, and we drew a spread map, a spreadsheet, comparing the Clinton Foundation with the Global Fund and PEPFAR. The results were stark. Our conclusions in the interest of time are this. Foreign agent. The foundation began acting as an agent of foreign governments early in its life and has continued doing so throughout its existence. As such, the foundation should have registered under FARA. Ultimately, the foundation and its auditors acknowledged this fact and conceded in formal submissions that it did operate as an agent. Therefore, the foundation is not entitled to 501c3 tax exemplary privileges as outlined in IRS 170C2. Misrepresentations. The Clinton Foundation did not comply with the requirements of 501c3 and that it far exceeded the purposes detailed in its original Articles of Incorporation filed December 23, 1997, and subsequently reaffirmed in numerous other records across many jurisdictions, including with NARA. The Foundation did pursue programs and activities for which it had neither sought nor achieved permission to undertake. Such was the case even before the completion and transferral of the Presidential Library in 2004. As such, 
representation, representation by the foundation to donors what was a misrepresentation of the approval, organizational tax status allowing it to raise funds for the presidential library and related programs therein. In these pursuits, the foundation failed the organizational and operational test 501c3 Internal Revenue Code 7.25.3. Additionally, the intentional misuse of donated public funds. The foundation falsely attested that it received funds and used them for charitable purposes, which was in fact not the case. Rather, the foundation pursued an array of activities, both domestically and abroad. Some may be deemed philanthropic, albeit unimproved, while others, much larger in scope, are properly characterized as profit-oriented and taxable undertakings of private enterprise, again failing the operational tests for philanthropy, philanthropy referenced above. The investigation clearly demonstrates that the foundation was not a charitable organization per se, but in point of fact was, was a closely held family partnership. As such, it was governed in a fashion in which it sought in large measure to advance the personal interests of its principals as detailed within the financial analysis of this submission and further confirmed within the supporting documentation and evidence section. Our last finding, donors' responsibilities. The private foundations that donated to the Clinton Foundation are themselves subject to tax payments on the donations that they made to the foundation under code IRC 4945, unless they meet specific conditions as outlined in IRS Code 727-19582. Completed. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you both for your testimony. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you said, I didn't, I didn't know you guys. I just came to the hearing today, wanted to see what you had to say. Uh, tell me your backgrounds. Are you both uh, accountants? No. My background, my undergraduate degree from Holy Cross, BA Economics, MBA International Finance, Old Dominion University, magna cum laude. Mr. Doyle? I, I worked, uh, I also graduated from Holy Cross as an economics major. I worked on Wall Street. Uh, I'm still uh, involved around finance for the last 10 years. I've spent extensive time uh, investigating and writing about uh, regulatory failure, including uh, publishing a book. Okay. Good. Um, let's go back to some of the things you said in your opening. Uh, Comments. You said there uh, earlier session. Mr. Conley said you guys were you had you were in, in the midst of a lawsuit. That's not that's not accurate. No, that's completely inaccurate. What we do is we do an investigation under the whistleblower statutes. If you find indicia, probable cause, we have not formulated any conclusions about this. We are under the law to submit that to the IRS. That is the jurisdictional oversight for this. We've made that to submission. Whatever the IRS finds and concludes, we stand by. So you, you've submitted that claim or that concern you have to the IRS, what you call a probable cause submission. When did you do that? August 11th, uh, 2017. So a year ago, a year and a half ago, almost. Okay. And um, why, why did you start this investigation? You getting someone hire you to go dig into this and figure out what's going on? No, nobody hired us to begin this investigation. We do 501c3 work. To be quite frank, you did it because we watched, if you find out there's there's big time abuse, you get there's some kind of um, you, you get paid. We do this for, we do this for a living. Yeah. If the okay. Clinton Foundation was a 2.5 million dollar issue, it would not have been economic. How many other cases disorder. have you done where you filed a probable cause uh, submission to the IRS? How many other times have you done that? First time. First time. Mm -hmm. So how have you got paid before? I mean, this this. Oh deal. well, we will get hired by law firms who represent 501c3s that right. need to get cleaned up. That's what I figured. Okay. Uh, so let's turn to a few, few of the things that I highlighted in your in your statements. You said uh, the books don't balance, right? The revenue doesn't match expenses. One of you made that sentence. Can you go in a little detail there? Give me an example. Well, we did uh, we did review revenues versus expenses. You know, across all their 990s. It's not so much that they didn't balance. It's what would be represented. We wanted to get our own. We did our own work, all our own work, and we created spreadsheets and yeah. we looked at, okay, what on a line item by line item basis, how much were salaries, how much on travel, how much on office expenses, uh, and just created that spreadsheet, again, just to follow the money. To, oh, so, to, yeah, right. It's not about balancing. It's about what they spend it on. Exactly. Got it. Right. 
Got it. Uh, you also said senior foundation executives and government officials were talking all the time in emails, and there was some, I think their statement said was something, some, it was stark what they had to say, I think was the word you used. Oh, it, Walk it, me through one of those emails. Give me an example of that. Well, I mean, the, the discussions between the uh, senior foundation officials uh, prior to the library being turned over to the National Archives, mm -hmm. while they were in the process of looking to launch their health-related activities, uh, just the, the nature of pushing that, those programs. And, uh, and when we looked at that, that caused uh, concern in terms of, well, this looked to be far outside what they were approved for. Yeah. You know, so they were out there, they're talking about these health-related activities. When we read their articles of incorporation, they were approved for a library. So that, that to us just was uh, an initial can you get us, can, can you get the committee an example of one of those emails where they're way outside the, 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 the limits of the parameters of where they're supposed to be? On that specific example, we're talking about a European country that is in a dialogue with senior members of the foundation and eventually signed an MOU for cash flows mm -hmm. to support programs. That was happening in 2002. The library, which is the only approval that the IRS gave to them, to the foundation, was turned over in 2004. Two years before the library was turned over to NARA, senior officials are in email exchanges and dialogue negotiating an MOU between a European-based company, country, and an African country. We have those exchanges. Okay. So to us, that's a red flag because your approval was for a library. Why are you negotiating health-related contracts? If you wanted to do that, you can. You change your articles of incorporation, you seek approval from the IRS, because that was specifically stated in the determination letter given to the foundation. The IRS gave them a, a determination letter following a 1023 application that said, should you change the purpose, source, intentions of what you're doing, you need to contact us for approval. They yeah. did not do that. And one message uh, over and above that, uh, in one of those emails, the statement was made, this is not a Clinton Foundation program per se, which in our reading and understanding of the law. Yeah, so which means it just isn't, right? Yeah, no, I understand. Exactly. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time. Uh, may, may I have a second round? Uh, the, the chair recognizes uh, Ms. Norton for five minutes. You submitted, thank you, sir, uh, a complaint to the IRS no. and the FBI with allegations against the Clinton Foundation. I think you testified to that in August. That's not correct, ma'am. That is we, not we, correct. No, we submit, what it is is we put together our investigative findings and then we, we do a submission. It's not a complaint, it's probable cause. A complaint is a final document that gets submitted to the court, say if we're gonna indict somebody or something like that. That's not what this is. We actually haven't reached any conclusions. We just are citing in our submission um, indicia or, or probable cause as to what has gone on, just, just to be correct. Why, why won't you give us a copy of whatever it is you submitted? We anticipated that question. We have this as an ongoing matter, and we don't know how the IRS will rule on that. Um, suffice it to well, say... What's the point of, not, of withholding it from this committee? I, I, I want to I answer your question very specifically, because there may be further causes of action that we can't pursue under the law, and we are not going to sacrifice our opportunity to pursue those. This is how we make a living. Not everything that we have done in our investigations are in those submissions. We only, we only put in our submission that which is applicable to a tax claim. We have not put into our submission anything that is not applicable to a tax claim. So there's, other, there's more to come. Uh, um, not necessarily in this forum, but yes. Now to, re to reiterate, you are not whistleblowers. We, file, we, we are people who are not from inside the Clinton Foundation. We are financial investigators on the outside of the Clinton Foundation in who fact, had to file a claim under the whistleblower statute. You are potential plaintiffs in a 
key tam lawsuit no you can't you cannot be a key tam plaintiff in a tax case that is not allowed within the law so what are you we in this case we file under the whistleblowers you didn't tell our staff last friday that you were plaintiffs in a key tam lawsuit absolutely not that is completely incorrect when our staff <coughs> the committee staff asked you for copies of documents you submitted to the IRS and the <laughs> FBI. You declined. Mm -hmm. You also said <laughs> that you had provided no documents to Republicans on this committee. We have not. Uh, somehow, however, on Monday, our Republicans did obtain 1,300 pages Correct. of documents from your submission. When they sent them over to us, they claimed you gave Chairman Meadows' office these documents on a disk. If anybody they from said, the Republican. They said you provided them. Did you or your attorney provide these documents to Chairman Meadows, his staff, or any other Republicans? We did not. So we're very confused. Last Monday, our staff emailed you, mm -hmm. or, or rather your attorney, mm -hmm. to ask if these documents, <coughs> again, I apologize, were provided <coughs> by, <coughs> by you. He responded, <coughs> Moynihan and Doyle did not provide any documents to Meadows' staff. Correct. It is my understanding <laughs> that they <coughs> gave the document that they were, it is my understanding they were given those documents by a reporter named John Solomon on his own initiative. Do you stand by your statement so that your conditions is you had nothing to do whatsoever with providing these documents to Republicans? Well, that's not what you asked me. Well, then respond. You asked me if I reported, if I delivered the documents to the Republicans, and we did not. But you did have something to do with it. Yes, but you didn't ask me that. So if you're asking me now, I am. The, 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 question, the answer is those documents following a pre preliminary denial letter by the IRS in which they asked for us for an appeal. We sent them the appeal with pictures of their own IRS agents working on the case. We submitted that in our appeal. We're getting those contradictory, documents were we're getting then, contradictory uh, information from our Republicans. Congressman. They, they sent us an email on Tuesday, and, and I'm quoting from it. We received the same 1,300 pages via Meadows' office, and they received this material from Doyle Moynihan. We, we, uh, Doyle Moynihan were reticent to come forward and share documents. We have been treating them as treat uh, as whistleblowers. After we received these documents, we asked them for permission, understand I'm quoting, uh, to share with you. Last Friday, their lawyer confirmed we were <coughs> good to share these documents. Mm -hmm. Now look, I don't understand both of these. <coughs> both oh, of these Congresswoman, we'll explain it. We, we were emphatic with your staff member that both sides have the same materials. That whatever the Republicans have, the Democratic side should have as well. We are here, not right versus left. John and I, we are all about right versus wrong. Well, with regard to your question, I want to be very specific. Those materials we later learned were supplied to the Republican side by John Solomon. We gave materials to John Solomon in our exercise of trying to understand the playing field here where the IRS, with its low number of personnel doing this, sends us... Why did you give him to a reporter? He's a, he's a reporter. And did you know... Why would we would give, give him to a reporter? Did you know that he would then give them to the committee? We did not know that. We did not know that. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I suggest that we take this matter up to clarify this confusion outside of hearings. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll be uh, glad to do that. I, I can assure the, the gentlewoman that anything that I have, 
the minority has, and and you know that I will not keep documents from you, and so uh, and I, I do want that to be clear. That we, we, actually, as, we agree. As do we. As do we. Yeah. We uh, want that. Uh, uh, yeah, we, so we agree I, I think y'all are in possession of everything that I have. Uh, we, we agree and, with you. And we want to make sure that everybody has a, lay, lay, uh, a level playing field here. Uh, the gentleman from Iowa is recognized. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I think you said uh, both of you have done extensive work with 501c3. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, could you tell me then what, what what is the average percentage of donations or revenues that go to the intended beneficiaries in the average 501c3? I mean, is it that, is that, it 20 percent? Is it 80 uh, percent? I, I don't know. A lot of the ones that we work on, to be quite frank, are the ones that have problems. Okay, so if you're asking me the question relative to the cases we've worked on, it's significantly lower than that. Not relative to the cases you work on, just for the industry. What would, what would be? You, you would hope and at least 15, maybe no more than 15% was administrative. You, you hope. So 85% of you contributions hope. would go to you the hope. intended beneficiaries. 80% yeah. somewhere in there. People got to make a living and, and, and you can expect administration within those, but this is about philanthropy in, in public support uh, for this. You, you got to give it to the people who need it. What was the percentage for the Clinton Foundation? Based upon the information we have from the 990s, and we do not believe that that is complete because we do not have subpoena power, that ranged somewhere around 60, 40%, well, well, I believe. Actually, uh, Congressman, if I could, it would be, if hopefully be beneficial if I could just quickly run through the percentage right. breakdown of expenses, yeah. if that's okay. Uh, it'll probably take too much time. Okay, just, well, okay. Just get, do you have an idea? How, I mean, grants and allocations, they, they uh, gave 12% with 12 compensation, salary, and benefits, 26%. Travel, 8%. Other and all other expenses, 12%. Do these percentages seem in line to you, given well, your expertise? Well, well overall, it, it might have been about 40% by our calculation ended up going to programs and 60% was admitted. What happened to the revenue levels, the contribution levels of the Clinton Foundation once the Clintons were no longer in political power? Well, what happened to them? They well, go they, up or down? Yeah, they, they went down, but quite Significantly? Frankly, quite frankly, our analysis doesn't include that. Our analysis takes, takes this particular foundation from 2005 right through 2015. We break it down dollar by dollar. We, we start with the first employer identification number issued by the IRS, and we tally that up year by year. We take the second employer identification number that was used solely for a two-year period for the initial CHI, which from our Freedom of Information Act requirements was approximately $22 million and was not approved to do that. And then in, in, your, in your analysis, did you come across what appeared to be pay to play? Well, to, I know that wasn't the focus necessarily. No, to but be, did you to come be across? very clear, to be very clear, um, our focus is on financial analysis and whether they live within the boundaries. As part and parcel of that investigation, we did come across instances of that, but we put that into a catch-all category okay. right. of just outside the boundaries. That's Mr. not Mr. really our. Mr. Focus. Chairman, I'd like I to yield be... the balance of my time to the gentleman from Ohio. Um, <clears throat> You said in your opening statement you used the term agent of a foreign government. Give me an example of that. You want to take that one now? Sure. Um, there are so many examples. Uh, Mozambique. Mozambique in, in 2002, there was a uh, uh, memorandum of agreement between the foundation and the uh, Mozambique to work uh, on their behalf through their Ministry of Health mm -hmm. program. And again, through that engagement, it was plainly obvious, again, based on emails that we've uh, uh, reviewed, that this was not a Clinton Foundation program per se. They were there to support the Mozambique Ministry of Health. So really, if you want to uh, reduce this to layman's terms, they were brokering money and they were brokering pharmaceuticals. That's the term on Wall Street we use, brokering. John uses the term agent. They were, they were an agent of money, 
through these donors. They would take a, for lack of a, uh, a term, better term, a VIG in terms of their fees, broker the money, and then they, they uh, negotiated these relationships with the pharmaceutical companies. And by the same token, they were brokering the pharmaceuticals and, again, taking the VIG. And is that why you, I think, one of your concluding remarks was the Clinton Foundation functioned as a closely held family partnership, not a charity? Y yes. The reality is the difference between public charities, private foundations, are very exact. Public charities are organizations that are allowed to solicit funds from the general public, which is what they were approved for, for the library. And they, f they followed that. They solicited funds from public folks. Going along with that, public charities really don't make grants. They don't. They're the end users. They, they do the program. I have my own 501c3s involving base, baseball. I, I fix up a lot of baseball fields in Massachusetts. So when people donate to that, it's very $20,000. We go and we pull the weeds out, okay? We do the work. Private foundations are different. Melinda and Bill Gates. On those boards, there may be one or two individuals. Those foundations are governed in a way that there is a specific function that's going to go on, and they issue grants. A lot of times, those grants go to a public charity. There are striking differences between public charities and private foundations. What happened here, for whatever reason, we don't know and don't have an opinion on it, it became a hybrid. And, and our analysis shows that this hybrid modeled the Global Fund in Geneva, Switzerland. That's a, that is a hugely important point. The difference between the Global Fund being a Geneva-based operation that does exactly what Mr. Doyle said, which is to take funds from one company, one country, excuse me, uh, for whatever purpose, pharmaceuticals or tuberculosis, and to help another country, they are the facilitator, the agent. The difference is they are not subject to U.S. taxation, and jurisdiction, or law. The Clinton Foundation, in conjunction with those same donor countries to the Global Fund and the same recipient countries as the Global Fund, created a separate entity called Unitaid that was formed in 2006. Mr. Clinton and Mr. Gates, who was on the board at Unitaid, together formed with these countries this entity. The difference being that Unitaid became the single largest donor to the Clinton Foundation. Those revenues did not stay outside of the United States. They created jurisdiction and venue by flowing back into the United States, Bank of America, Boston, Massachusetts. That then becomes under the jurisdiction of the governing body, the Internal Revenue Service. At that point, okay, if I'm, they I'm, are going to be a facilitator and an agent of those money flows, the IRS code could not be any more specific. You can't do that and be an exempt organization. It's okay that you do it. You just pay your taxes. Okay. I'm, I'm going to cut you off there. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, so, Mr. Doyle, Mr. Moynihan, I'm, I'm going to ask you to try to be succinct and direct okay. and, and, and bluntly. Uh, maybe dumb it down for me. I mean, okay. you're talking about stuff that, quite frankly, I have no clue. You know, when you start quoting different statutes and, and, and things like that, the average American, ha we just want to know if there's wrongdoing or not. And I know you say you don't have an opinion. If you don't have an opinion, then why did you file a probable cause filing with the IRS? Because obviously you have an opinion that something was wrong or you wouldn't have done a probable cause. Based Is that on, correct? Based on our facts. On facts. Based on your facts. Do you believe there's probable cause of wrongdoing? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. Y Mr. Doyle. Hugely. Yes. Okay. All right. So, so let, me, let me get to this. I think you, you guys have been well advised in terms of trying to protect your interests. So let me just be blunt. I checked with the IRS commissioner. Nothing that you say in this forum, according to him, will actually affect any potential claim that you've already submitted. That's what he told me. So... 
If that is indeed the case, do you have a problem giving the 6,000 pages that you've submitted, if it will not affect your financial claims, to the minority and the majority of this committee? Do you have a problem with that? We'll take that under advisement no, of counsel. I, I, well, then you need, to, you need to go ahead with your counsel right now because, listen, my patience is running thin. Mm -hmm. You're here to provide expert testimony on what you've found. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is, is that if you have a legitimate claim, we will protect that. But, in, but if you're not going to share the information with this committee and, and cut to the chase, my patience is running out. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few seconds to talk to your attorneys, and you can come back and decide how you want to proceed. Mm -hmm. Okay? Perfect. So we just spoke to our attorney. Uh, we will not be providing all those materials. We will answer any questions that you have. All right. So, so just so you're aware and your counsel is aware, uh, have you submitted those, all those documents to the IRS? Yes. Have you submitted them to the FBI? Yes. Okay. We, we will compel you to, to bring all those documents to this committee then. And, and I, I can just tell you, uh, I, I think you're being poorly advised by your counsel, and I'm saying that directly to you, sir. Let me just tell you, this is a hearing to get to the truth. And what you're saying is you're all about the truth, Mr. Monahan. Isn't that what you said? Sure, so just ask. Okay, if you're about the truth, then why aren't you willing to give us the documents? Because we're explaining the documents. We have other claims. I don't think we should be sacrificing our potential. I said claims. if I could protect your financial claims and get a commitment from the IRS, would you be willing to give those documents? But that's not our only claim is with the IRS. You keep making that mistake. Our claim isn't just with the IRS. We have other claims that we can bring. So, so you're saying you're going to bring civil, uh, civil or uh, we a have complaint that against the foundation? We have opportunities that we will pursue. This is what we do for a living. All right, sir. so let me understand that. So you're, you're saying potentially you're going to bring a civil lawsuit against the Clinton Foundation and, and that this public hearing might affect that? No, that, we didn't say that. What we're saying is that the IRS, the, excuse me, the, the IRS submission stands on its own merit. The IRS will make their determinations based upon what they find. If the IRS finds one way, we'll have one reaction. If they find another way, we'll have another reaction with counsel. Mr. Monahan, do you believe that uh, based on any interviews that you've done with anybody at the Clinton Foundation that there was criminal activity that might have, might have, um, happened within the Clinton Foundation? We believe there is indicia of that, yes. All right, and you, you base that based on what? The interviews. W with whom? We interviewed Mr. Andy Kessel. Uh, Larry, you can speak to that directly. We, we were together. We interviewed Mr. Kessel on November 30th, 2016. I had reached out to him in early to mid-October. Of uh, uh, Andy was a former acquaintance of mine on Wall Street. Andy called me back on November 9th at 9.45 in the morning. Uh, about three to three, three and a half weeks after I had reached out to him. We exchanged pleasantries. I had informed uh, uh, Mr. Kessel about my relationship with Mr. Moynihan so that he was fully aware of, uh, of who John was. We got together and um, he was very forthcoming. We stand by every word uh, that we provided. So what does forthcoming mean? Uh, I mean, what, what alleged criminal activity do you believe that the Clinton Foundation may have may have uh, been a part of. His statements to us were very clear and very genuine. He told us that Mr. Clinton on a regular basis mixed and matched his personal business on an ongoing basis with that of the foundation. All right, so, so your conversations with Mr. Kessel indicated that there was commingling of funds between the president and the foundation. Is that correct? 
Yeah, expenditure of donated funds between his personal. So he would use uh, donated funds to the foundation for personal use. That Private was, inurement is what they would call that. That was stated to us, yes. And so uh, were there any other criminal allegations? Well, he just stated to us very specifically, and it kind of took us both off guard, to be quite frank. I was, it, I've been doing this business for a long time when someone says to me, quote, I know where all the bodies are buried. It was shocking. Uh, but, but, but that's hyperbole. So go ahead. Tell me what is the other cr potential criminal activity that may have happened? Well, his statements to us about that we have submitted with the IRS. It's up to them to make a determination on that. What are the alleged criminal, other criminal activity that was communicated to you, Mr. Moynihan, from Mr. Kessel? What he communicated to us was the commingling of funds. That's the most specific of illegal activities right. on a regular and ongoing basis. Did you, did you have uh, another interview with Mr. Ms. Fischel? Ms. who? Barbara Fischel. Barbara Any? Fischel? Yeah, is there no. anybody else that you interviewed other than that? We did. Who, who was that? We're not at liberty to give that name. Sir, your you're sworn testimony, let me just tell you, that dog doesn't hunt here. Oh, I so if, if you've interviewed someone else, you, as a witness, you're required to answer that or plead the fifth. What, what well, do you want to do? We made a confidentiality agreement with her at the time, so we'll plead the fifth. But we're happy to speak about the interview. We just can't give her name up. So what you're saying is you have a confidentiality, uh, confidentiality agreement with someone you interviewed. Yeah. W w and and what was person, that person's position? A, a very senior position within the Clinton Healthcare Access Program. All right. So within what is, I guess, referred to as CHI. Is yes. that the largest part of the Clinton Correct. Foundation? Yes. yes. And how many, how many dollars of assets would be in the CHI part of the foundation? Oh, we've got it right here. Well, just give us a minute. We'll look yep. in the approximately 900 million by the uh, analysis that we had done. Okay, and and what were the allegations that she alerted you to? She stated very specifically um, that the funds were used as essentially a piggy bank. You could travel and vacation when you wanted to. That the senior administrators within this fund operating this fund, treated this and commingled this as personal business, foundation business, for travel and per personal expense. So what you're saying is, is that they could use the Clinton Foundation charitable donations for private travel and go on personal trips. Is that what you're saying? Yes, we see that as conversion of foundation property. What else? We can, I think we'll look through things. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. She also referenced uh, Mr. Clinton's relationship with uh, one of his largest donor, that being Bill Gates, at which point in time he, she said that they were not on speaking terms uh, and referenced uh, the, the fact that at, at this point in time during 2009 that the, the health initiative had not received you know, prior, uh, formal approval by the IRS for their activities. In fact, so, so hold, hold on. So you're saying the Clinton Foundation had not received proper uh, approval? Uh, who, who did not receive proper approval? The Clinton Health, at, prior to 2010, CHI was uh, the acronym for Clinton HIV AIDS. Uh, what we are led to believe from this interview was Mr. Gates telling Mr. Clinton, you need to get formal approval for this activity, which went all the way back to 2002. That's the premise of our submission. That, and it was at that point in time that they actually went and got uh, formal approval for that activity from the, uh, from the IRS, and Chai then became known as Clinton Health Ac Access Initiative. Cool. All right, so who, who approved the, the 501c3 status for the foundation? It would have been the IRS. It, one of uh, who at the IRS? Do you have the document? Uh, yeah, well, it, we have it. Maybe, I don't know what the person's name is offhand, but we've got the determination letters. And it was approved for what? Building a library or? The initial approval was simply for a library. So who, uh, who modified it? That's what we worked on. 
we saw no modifications to the Articles of Incorporation. If you want to change your status, you need to notify the IRS. No, I, I get that. You've said okay. that before. Okay. So was there any modification? No. All right. Uh, we've got a second round. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia, I'm going to go to you in just a second as soon as you're ready. So, Could I yeah. answer to your question? A very specific misrepresentation that went on with the second chai. I think that's what you want to know. In, in, in order to go forward, the application has a Schedule G that asks you if this second chai is a successor organization to a previous one. So you have the library. Then you have this chai running unapproved. They clearly were advised, conversations involving Mr. Gates and what have you, as we've learned, you got to get approved. They go and make an application. And on the form, Schedule G, when it's asked, is this a successor operation? They specifically and affirmatively answer no. That is a misrepresentation because it's the same people doing the same thing it's the same people doing the same thing. Additionally, we asked uh, this individual about the, the Charity Navigator rating of a four star, to which she laughed out loud and said, I've worked within charitable uh, organizations at large firms. The Clinton Foundation is the furthest thing from a four star rating. In fact, that person went on to further state to us that, that she advised her own friends in multiple businesses where she had worked previous to that to stop donating to the Clinton Foundation. It was so bad. All right, so, uh, so gentlemen, I'm, I'm gonna yield to the gentleman from, from Georgia. Let, let, me, let me say this, so. Um, it is critically important that we have the documents. You know, we can hear your testimony all day long, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not fair to Ms. Norton, nor to me, for us to have your, your testimony that we can't verify with these other documents. It's just like you submitting something and suggesting that it's one way with the IRS. Have you submitted these documents to the FBI? Yes. Do you believe that they have opened up an investigation on it based on your conversations with the FBI? Yes. 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 So you believe that there is an uh, uh, open criminal investigation by the FBI on the Clinton Foundation out of what field office? Little Rock, Little Rock, Arkansas. Arkansas. So you believe out of Little Rock, Arkansas, there's an open criminal investigation into the Clinton Foundation going based on information that you've submitted to the FBI? The agent informed me as to how very, very, very grateful he was for our documents and the case fashion in which we presented it. All right, so that, that is incredibly important. If you're telling me there's an open criminal investigation, maybe that, under, maybe that makes sense why Mr. Huber was not here. Because if he couldn't comment on an ongoing investigation, perhaps that's why he didn't show up. That's why we want you, to, you as the committee to come to your own logical conclusions and not have us make conclusions for you. All right. I, I'll, I'll recognize uh, the gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for having to step out. I know some of my concerns and questions have no doubt already been covered, uh, but I do want to just bring up a couple of things for my own uh, satisfaction and understanding. And I will reiterate the, the necessity of the documents. To be very honest with you, I was a little hesitant coming into this uh, second uh, panel here because I feel like you're using us for your own benefit, and we need the information so that we can do the proper oversight that we're uh, responsible for Excuse doing. Excuse me, sir. You invited us. We didn't invite ourselves. No, but you've not turned over the documents, uh, and, and we, need, uh, we need those documents to perform the Let oversight. Let me be very clear. You invited us. We told the, the staff members you I weren't going to get documents, and if you didn't want to invite us, then disinvite us. I, I understand who invited who, but I also know there's a little game going on here, and I understand f f from a financial perspective some of it, but we are here to do oversight, and we need cooperation. Uh, did, have you been in contact uh, w with Attorney uh, Huber or anyone on his investigative team? We, we sent all of our information and documents to Salt Lake City, Utah in early April. We provided subsequent information in mid-April, late May, and uh, then again in mid to late October. 
our first communication uh, with the, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office out of Salt Lake was late November. I guess it was two weeks ago. All right, so you have been in communication. We received uh, two incoming phone calls uh, that Friday. Um, Can you say with whom? Uh, who, who contacted you? One of the assistant U.S. attorneys. And when was that? I, that Friday afternoon, uh, whatever that. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, two November weeks ago. 30th, yeah. was it? Prior? All right, so there's no communication prior to two weeks ago? No, there was not. No. Okay. Um, and what was the basic nature of the communication? We're, we are reviewing your materials. Okay. So you did not have a conversation Oh, no, oh, no, no, sir. To be clear, just like with the FBI, it's a one-way communication. They uh, ask, they don't tell. All right. So how do you know then whether or not they're following up on the information you gave them? Based upon their questions. All right. But they didn't tell you that they're following up. No, they, they asked for material. All right, so you're giving an educated guess that you believe they're Absolutely. following Absolutely. All right. Uh, what about the uh, Justice Department's Inspector General Michael, Michael Horowitz? Have you been in communication with him or anyone on his team? We uh, informed the Inspector General of our submission and documents just by a letter uh, back, I could look at the date up, probably somewhere uh, mid-year. All right. Have you heard back? Has there been any communication? No. No. All right. So you don't know if anything is going on no, on not. that end at all? All right, in 2011, the uh, uh, Clinton Foundation hired an outside law firm, S Simpson Thatch Thatcher, that came up in the first um, the panel, uh, and they were talking about uh, performing a governance review of the organization. Are you familiar with, with that? Yes. Um, all right, this memo has been widely spread in the, in the media, and you're familiar with it. Uh, based on your investigation, uh, do you find any indication that there was ever a quid pro, pro quo uh, of donations in return for some sort of um, action by Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State? Yeah, but it doesn't come from that memo. It comes from our own investigation. Yeah, well, that was my question. From your investigation, Yes. are you convinced that that took place? Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Chair recognizes the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. I want to further clarify because, Mr. Doyle, you indicated how very grateful the FBI was for the information. But the FBI never confirms what they're going to do with, an, with, with information uh, or, or indicate that there would be an ongoing open criminal investigation. Did, did it? Pardon me? You didn't hear my question, Mr. Doyle? I, I did not hear it. It was you who said how grateful the FBI was to receive information. Yep, yes. I, I am asking you uh, whether they in any way confirmed that this information would be used as part of an ongoing criminal investigation. No, he didn't. No. I want to just to clarify that. Now, I also want to clarify because of your own status because um, you don't classify yourself as whistleblowers, right? Well, we're, we would be an outside whistleblower, not an inside whistleblower. Are you a, this is a key, a key TAM lawsuit against the Clinton Foundation. Not involving us. But what? Not involving us. We don't have a key TAM lawsuit. You are potential plaintiffs for... We will never have a key TAM tax lawsuit involving the Clintons. It's not allowed. We have a submission to the IRS. We are not adverse to the Clinton Foundation. If any action is taken, it's taken by the IRS. It's not taken by us. We submit probable cause. They determine if there's an action to be taken. We are not adverse in our submission to the, client, uh, to the Clinton Foundation. We gave them probable cause. They'll determine it. Are you seeking uh, any monetary award? Yes. If, if the IRS is successful, the whistleblower statute allows for a reward for U.S. How much money are you seeking? Whatever the IRS determines. The whistleblower program has a 10 to 30 percent payout. We would maintain that the taxable uh, revenue could run anywhere from $400 million to $2.5 billion. <coughs> Very important to put that on the record. 
uh, <coughs> just to confirm, <coughs> you, you yourselves never worked for the Clinton Foundation. No. Uh, you have not had access to their internal files or anything of the like? No. No. Uh, now, <coughs> in your written testimony, and here's this, this data gain, you stated that you had sent your submission to the IRS on August 11th, 2017. Correct. Yep. Uh, you also conceded, and I quote, this is important, recently rec we received a letter of preliminary denial of our claim. Correct. We asked you, what does that mean? And we asked you for a copy of that letter from the IRS. Mm -hmm. Why won't you give us a copy since you did receive a letter of preliminary denial? Because we're in an appeal status right now. You're, you're appealing the denial. Yeah, so they actually encourage you. They actually say in the letter, please submit an appeal. They actually ask you, please submit an appeal as, as if we're wrong. So what we did is we sent our appeal in with a photocopy of the FBI and the IRS CID on their jackets removing boxes from the Clinton Foundation after they had brought a 757 down um, and taken all the materials out of the Clinton Foundation Little Rock, Arkansas. We sent that with our appeal to demonstrate to the IRS that your letter coming from Atlanta doesn't reconcile with what's going on in Little Rock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the chair recognizes himself, so I, I want to do a little follow-up here. So y your conversations with the special agents in Little Rock, Arkansas, Mr. Doyle, was that you? That was me. All right, and so your conversations with them, uh, they acknowledged they had received your submission and you, the pages of documents. Is that correct? That is correct. And did they acknowledge any work that they're doing with that, either directly or indirectly? Did not comment. So they just said thank you for the submission. Well, it, I mean, it was it was a very cordial, professional conversation. I can't comment. Thank you very much. You know, we were very, very grateful for your for your efforts. And then, your, then what your, makes you believe that there's a criminal investigation out of Little Rock? Then, if that's the extent of it, I spoke to him twice. I spoke to him in, in August, and then again in October. All right, so what would make you think that there's a criminal investigation, Mr. Doyle? I mean, if it was just cordial, I mean, then why would you believe that I, there's... Well, in the, in the August uh, conversation, he said this is an open and ongoing situation. All right, so he said this is an open and ongoing uh, situation? Uh, investigation or situation? In or matter. I, I apologize. Investigation. All right. So it was an open and ongoing investigation that he couldn't comment on. Yes. So that would in, indeed indicate that there's an investigation. And, and, and Chairman, look, I worked for the DEA. I, I do work all over the world in these cases still. The fact that they followed up with a second inquiry, not just, hey, thanks, don't let the door hit you on the way out, but then they follow up again. That's not the sign of a closed investigation. I, I get that, Mr. Moynihan, but I can't take your experience at the DEA, and, and I appreciate the, the thought, but the other part of that is, Mr. Doyle, if they said there was an open and ongoing investigation, that's what you recall that they said. That is what I recall to the best of my memory. And so, so if indeed there's an open and ongoing investigation, and you've given the information to them, um, why would the IRS not view that as substantial? Well, well that, that's... Did they know that there was an open and ongoing investigation? We, we sent a picture to the yeah, IRS. I, I, I heard that. Right, so, so they know. That Some part of the we IRS knows. that in our appeal letter. In your appeal. All right. And, and, and to that point, Congressman, the IRS individual was, I, I would say, more than mildly surprised at our interaction with the FBI. All right. Why do you think Mr. Huber waited until November the 30th to call you about 
four letters that you had sent prior because you had sent one on the 14th, the 18th, the 29th, of, those were in April, 29th of May, as I recall, and October the 10th or 12th, based on what I understand. Why did they wait until November 30th to give you a call? We don't know. Do you difficult. think it might have had to do with the fact that you're coming here to testify? Well, I mean, that this testimony invitation just came recently. I, I don't know why. They were fully aware because we had asked them to come and be a witness at this particular hearing, and then all of a sudden you get a phone call from Mr. Huber's, what, second in command? Is that correct? I don't know if he's a second, but he, he was clearly an assistant U.S. attorney dealing directly with Mr. Huber. So I find it just very coincidental that on November 30th, a few days before the hearing, after they had been noticed that we wanted them to come and testify, all of a sudden they would start following up. So, Mr. Doyle, what did they say about the documents that you had provided them? Did they have them all? Congressman, he said that we are reviewing your material. I asked him if he could comment if uh, further beyond that, if this was open and ongoing. He said... We are reviewing your material. He called me back a few hours later, uh, asked specifically about you know, one exhibit, and then asked uh, further if you could, uh, you know, do you have these on a disc? I said, I am on, have them on a thumb drive. Uh, would you like them? Please resend them. So I resent the, uh, the thumb drive that afternoon. So was that the first time that, that Mr. Huber and his team actually got the documents from you, Mr. Doyle? That was, that was the third time. third time. So you're telling me that on November 30th they called you back and they couldn't find the first two submissions that you had made to the Department of Justice and, and Mr. Huber? That they wanted you to send them again? That's Is what that we, what you're telling me? We're, we're concluding that ourselves. That's what we concluded. And it was just what I've been told by DOJ, which I do not believe, just to be frank, is that this was the normal process of following up on recent correspondence. What was the most recent correspondence that you had with the Department of Justice? That one. October 10th? Well, I had the co correspondence that, that with the attorney. Well, after oh, the follow-up. Prior to the phone call, what was the most recent correspondence you had with the Department of Justice, Mr. Huber? Oh, I, uh, we sent materials... Uh, October the 10th of 2018, I, I believe, I believe delivered by case. FedEx on yes, October 12th yes, of yes, 2018. Yes, yes, right. I yes. think I got a copy yes, of the yes, FedEx yes. delivery. Yes. Right. And so they didn't respond to your April 4th letter. They didn't respond to the letter later in April. They didn't respond to the May 29th letter. And they, di and they finally responded to your October 10th letter a few days before a hearing that was coming up. Correct. That is correct. Do you think that that's, that shows the level of interest that a special prosecutor would show? We don't know his caseload, but quite frankly, we're disappointed that three years level of effort goes into this. We are not paparazzi. We are not the media. We don't want anybody to even know who we are and the work that we do. We're financial investigators. That's what we do. We get paid to do this for a living. We work for ourselves. We don't get paid by anybody else. And Congressman, we... So it's disappointing that it took that long and, and we, to hear from them. We shared our materials, not only with the attorney uh, office in Salt Lake, also uh, uh, in Little Rock, but other U.S. attorney's offices as well that had been indicated as, you know, providing support or working on Clinton-related matters. We also shared our materials with the, uh, the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Um, so various jurisdictions that we felt would be interested both at the state and federal level. And you've shared all of those documents with those entities, and yet you somehow do not believe that you should share it with Congress and the American people? Well, this yeah, answer year. that one for me, Mr. Look, Monahan. I'll I, answer it I really, I want, to, I want to hear this because, you quite frankly... Are you going to I, prosecute the Clintons? Are you going to bring an action against the Clintons that would yield us economic consortium? I don't think you are. Those entities... But I thought, hold on to your testimony. Don't get cute with me because I promise I'm you... I'm telling I, you the truth. I, I promise you. I thought you said you were all about the rule of law. That was in your opening statement. We all are, about and that, justice and truth. And that's why we've presented to the law enforcement agencies, which you're not. Mr. Moynihan, let me just say this. We have an oversight responsibility, and I can assure you 
that when you come in here, it is incumbent upon you to be open and transparent. Mm -hmm. And we can make criminal referrals just like anybody else. Now, we cannot prosecute. You're exactly right. But what I can tell you is this, is that when you come before us and you've shared it with all kinds of entities, and to not actually listen to my my good friend to my right here and say, you deserve to see the same evidence that we've shared with others. Uh, I, I don't find how that actually provides a good foundation for truth and transparency. It's just, I think we're looking at that, this from completely different perspectives. We have financial investigators. We do cases. We present our evidence to those jurisdictions, in this case, the IRS, that would bring a case. That's not what you do. So that's why we present it to them and not to you. Okay. Well, I can assure you that we do have something here that will compel us to get the information, either from you or from the agencies. Sure. Uh, and and I, I can assure you that we will, so that my good friend to my right and the entire committee can review these documents and make their, their own claim. We, we welcome that from you. Final question. Mr. Doyle, you said anywhere from $400 million to $2.5 billion uh, might be subject to taxation. Uh, so you're saying worst case is, in your opinion, $400 million uh, were improperly used in a charitable foundation uh, named the Clinton Foundation. Is that correct? That is correct. And it could be all of it? It could be all of it. All right. If there's no further business before the committees, uh, the committee stands adjourned.